First of all, thank you for joining us for this webinar. It's a webinar which is organized jointly between the EU platform members, European Federation for Hunting and Conservation, Conservation FAS, and the International Council for Game and Wildlife Conservation, the CIC, and the Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe, the LCIE. My name is Jürgen Tak. I'm scientific director of the European Land Owner Organization and as ELO is a co-chair together with the European Commission of this uh, large carnivore platform, I'm chairing the meeting today. Subject of the web webinar today is stakeholder involvement in large carnivore monitoring. For instance, where interest groups contribute data useful for monitoring schemes, hunters especially have a potential to do this. Now, the monitoring of large carnivores is legally necessary to fulfill the requirements of the Habitats Directive. And there are many different types of monitoring and surveying methods, and the most appropriate is a difficult balancing act between accuracy and costs, as well as the methods that suit in a particular environment. Involving stakeholders can both increase the amount of data collected and also the acceptance of the results, but it's not always as easy uh, or practical to do in reality. And so today we want to increase understand the understanding of what is needed for a successful monitoring and the desirability of involving stakeholders. So specifically this morning, we will give an overview of different monitoring techniques, which are used all over Europe. And then we will have a look at some examples of stakeholder involvement from a range of EU countries. Then we will have a coffee break and following the coffee break, we will have a panel discussion on what the EU platform can do to share information on monitoring and stakeholder involvement. But let me first start with giving you a short introduction in what the EU platform uh, is. Here you still see our agenda and then we go into the presentation. Uh, you can go immediately to the next slides. And here we see uh, the launching date of the platform, the 10th of June, 2014. In the meantime, a little bit more than six years ago. And the mission from, uh, from the start of the platform was to promote ways and means to minimize and wherever possible, find solutions to conflicts between human interest and the presence of large carnivore species. And that is something we do by exchanging knowledge and by working together. And we do that systematically and always in an open-ended, in a constructive and in a mutually respectful way. Next slide, please. We have a number of key principles, which are the basic rules of the platform and also of the meeting today. We work systematically within the EU legal framework. That means the Habitats Directive. We systematically ensure that we have the necessary knowledge base so that we have scientific, scientific proof uh, for the discussions we are having. We are recognizing socioeconomic and cultural considerations and concerns by different stakeholders. And the aim is systematically to find solutions to conflicts through a constructive dialogue. And that we do by engaging us in a transboundary cooperation. Next slide, please. Who are the platform members? Um, that is uh, ELO, the European Land Owners Organization. We have FAS, the European Federation of Associations for Hunting and Conservation. We have the joint representatives of Finnish and Swedish reindeer herders. The CIC, the International Council for Game and Wildlife Conservation. IUCN, the World Conservation Union. WWF, the World Wide Fund for Nature, uh, specifically represented by their European Policy Office and we have the Europark Federation. Next slide. What are the main activities? Well, we have quite a number of communication activities, including a newsletter, platform website, statements, press releases, and so. And then, of course, we have links with, uh, with many different other projects, especially with the regional platforms established under European contracts. And those are including Italy, Romania, Spain, Germany, France, Sweden. We have an annual meeting, which is most of the time in, uh, in May, and we have a number of regional workshops. And up to uh, now, we had uh, workshops in Bulgaria, Germany, Romania, Italy, Finland, Montenegro. 
And they were organized between platforms. And quite often, we are working together for that with the regional platforms in those regions. We are also doing research and data gathering with case studies. We are gathering information on and evaluating national and regional platforms. Uh, we are uh, checking for funding for reducing conflict and support and coexistence, co coexistence. And in the past years, we have been working on fear and risk with large carnivores. Next slide, please. What are now the specific aims of this webinar? Uh, today, we would like to clarify the different activities carried out in surveying monitoring large carnivore populations. Now that is including the differences between mapping distributions, estimating populations, and estimating changes over time. Each of those methodologies taking different approaches, sometimes different in different EU member states. So we will have a closer look on uh, those activities. We also would like to show how st stakeholders, and then today in this webinar specifically, hunters are involved in surveying and inputting data to monitoring schemes. And then a third uh, objective of this meeting is to discuss the des desirability and potential for expanding the role of stakeholders in data collection. Next slide, please. We will have a number of questions towards the participants. Now, this is organized as a webinar, so that, it's mean, that means it's not fully interactive. But anyhow, we would like to hear from you, our participants. And to start with, we will ask you some questions. But first, we would like you to know, first of all, we would like to know what type of organization you belong to. Now, you can join us making use of Mentimeter and enter the code you see on the screen, and you see that on top of the screen. So if you go to www.menti.com, and then you use the code 508946.3. Once you have put in this code, you can work with Mentimeter. Now, for those people having a, a smartphone uh, close by, I would say make use of the smartphone so you can exactly combine between uh, uh, the Mentimeter website and the presentation of today. In the meantime, we see that the first answers are coming in. Uh, I will give you a little bit time to go to www.menti.com. Don't forget to use the code 5089463. And please do participate because we would like to ask you a couple of questions now, but we would like to come back to you later on and see whether your, your opinion, yes or no, is changing throughout this webinar. We have in the meantime, 26 participants in the Mentimeter. So we hope to get some more, even if we already see. It's a little bit like the European Sun Contest. After the first votes, you already have the impression of who is going to be in the top three. I see we have in the meantime, 45 participants participating out of the almost 80 in the webinar. But I think we can say that a majority of you who have indicated uh, your identity of scientists at the moment, that is 60, 61%, but let's say around 60%. Then we see that uh, environmental NGOs are very well presented uh, with 20% uh, of the people, uh, for 7% hunters, 6% uh, managing authorities, which can be local, regional, or at the national level. We have park administrations participating and a couple of people just with a general interest in large carnivores. Okay, that already gives us a very good overview of who is participating, but we do have a second question. And the second question is a little bit divided for hunters on one side and for non-hunters on the other side. Firstly, if you have identified yourself as a hunter, we would like to know if you would like to be involved in large carnivore monitoring.
so only answer this question if you have identified yourself as a hunter. And I think this is more or less stabilizing. And then we see that an overwhelming majority is indicating, yes, we would like to contribute to data monitoring schemes for large carnivores. At the moment, out of 15 responses, we have 87 saying, yes, we would like to be involved, 13. No, that's not something I would like to take part on. And now uh, let's have a question for those who have answered that they are non-hunters. And for, from you, we would like to, to know what your views are on hunters being involved in monitoring schemes. Do you think that hunters' data should be used, yes or no? And here we have a clear trend with 35, 36 people answered. Uh, I was just was going to say we have a 100% yes. Uh, but now getting in some people indicating that they should not be involved. But even then we still have an overwhelming majority indicating that Hunter's data should be used in monitoring schemes. At the moment with 46 participants, we have 96% of the people saying that Hunter's data should be used in monitoring schemes. Well, thank you very much already for this contribution. As I said, we will come back to you later uh, with, the, with the Mentimeter. Now, for the, I also would like to say there is a second way for you to participate. Um, you have the opportunity to send in questions for the panel discussion. And for this, we would like to ask you to focus on the webinar topic and particularly what we can do at the EU level to improve access to information on monitoring schemes. Now, how can you do that? Uh, you will see a question and answers buttons. And uh, normally it's at the lower end of your, uh, of your screen. And uh, if you click on the question and answer session, then you will see that there is a small uh, uh, window popping up in which you can put uh, your question and send it to us. We will also monitoring the questions, all of those questions to make sure that they're relevant to the topic. And wherever possible, we will try uh, to make use of those questions uh, later on in the panel discussion. Okay, uh, let's start the real work. And a first person I would like to introduce to you is John Linnell. He currently works at the Department of Terrestrial Ecology of the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research. And John conducts interdisciplinary research on the interactions between humans and wildlife with a view to promoting coexistence. He's a very active member of the Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe, and he's going to present us what type and quality of data are needed for large carnivore monitoring, the design and implementation of surveys and monitoring schemes. John. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, just let me share my screen. Am I sharing a screen and can you hear me? You are sharing a screen, but it's uh, now it's also in presentation mode. It's excellent. Good, then we're there. So um, I could talk about monitoring carnivals for many, many hours. Um, but what I decided was to focus on some of the very general fundamental principles, not so much related to the scientific aspects because the talks afterwards will illustrate some of those from some very good case studies. But I want to just really take us back to some of the fundamental basics, which I think are essential to consider irrespective of which type of technique we're using in the field. So kind of first of all, this is the most eternal and most basic question that you're confronted with in, in, in our game is how many are there and where are they? And it's concerns whether you work on wolf or lynx or bear or wolverine, everybody seems to uh, can want to ask how many are there? And these seem like very simple questions, but unfortunately in science, the simple questions often have the most difficult answers. And answering these kind of questions for any species is unchallenging. And for large carnivores, it's probably extra challenging because they're very rare species. It's not like you could walk out the door and count one, two, three, four, five. 
they're incredibly cryptic. Like they're incredibly good at living close to us and we don't see them. So they can be there and we simply don't realize that they are there very often. If we're going to do any meaningful surveys on large carnival numbers, we have to work over massive areas. You know, you don't consensus the large carnival population on your farm or on your hunting area. You're calculating large carnival densities over kind of the areas of counties or cantons or provinces and even countries. And the other issue that comes into effect here is kind of politics. There's an awful lot of interest among different stakeholder groups to have kind of different numbers. Some seem to want to inflate the numbers, so there's always more than there actually are. Others want to have them as low as kind of possible. So there's an awful lot of interest in having certain outcomes, which makes it often quite difficult to come across with objective assessments. So these are sort of the, some of the underlying challenges that we all, always have to deal with. Um, one of the other questions which is really important to take into account is why monitor? And how you answer this question will very much influence the intensity and the accuracy of the monitoring that you have to do. So everybody in Europe has to fulfill the reporting criteria for the EU. So every six years you have to have an update on distribution and numbers and trends. And that in a way does not require a very intensive monitoring. Um, and if you're not really managing them, if you're not hunting them, then maybe that is enough information to keep a track on things. But in countries where these species, like for example, are game species, or where populations are very small, then you maybe need to have a totally different approach with much more frequent assessment and much higher resolution. Um, so in relation to this, answering the question as to why, you will choose maybe different methods, you maybe will choose different areas of coverage um, and you'll be altering the frequency. Do you do this every year or every second year or every six years? Not everybody will answer the question in, in the same way as to why. So every country may end up having a different answer. When monitoring, there are really three elements which have to be taken into account. So of course, things have to be scientifically robust. But I think it's very important that we realize that monitoring large carnivores on the European scale is not a scientific study. It's something much bigger where you have to, in a way, also weigh up the scientific approach with the fact that, first of all, it has to be practical over large areas, and also it has to be credible. And the issues of practicality and credibility are the things that really open up for an engagement with many types of interest groups and kind of citizen scientists to produce, um, to co-produce a, a monitoring program, which is, simple, which is both scientifically strong, but also achievable and believable. So not one of these points can work on their own and you cannot ignore any of them. So all points here have to be included. When it comes into monitoring, there's lots of different things that you can monitor, but the things which really are probably most important are the distribution and numbers. Um, the other aspects are also crucial, but not as important as the distribution and numbers, because these are the things that you have an obligation to report for the EU, and which are really probably the most important parameters. Um, just to take an example of distribution, um, for the last, what, 15 years, the LCIE has been trying to produce these kind of European overview maps of um, distribution of wolf, bear, lynx, and wolverine. And we have these kind of nice maps which look, which have little squares. Each square is a 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell. The data behind on, on these maps is incredibly diverse. In some places, it might be DNA samples. In some cases, it'll be tracks in the snow. Many other ones will be dead wolves. It could be dead livestock. It'll be camera trap images and many other types of data. So when we work on distribution, we tend to combine pretty much any source of verifiable information about the species and presence. Um, the other thing which is important on uh, this map is we have two colors. We have a darker blue and a lighter blue. And these are separating between two different types of distribution. The darker is a distribution of reproduction. And the lighter one is simply the total um, distribution. So large carnivores are incredibly mobile. Like right, this first thing juveniles can travel hundreds of kilometers. 
uh, from home and travel over massive areas. So simply just because a young wolf or a young bear has passed through a landscape doesn't really mean this should be counted as part of its kind of reproductive or regular distribution. So if we had counted, for example, all of light blue areas, especially in Scandinavia, then we would be really overestimating the regular distribution of wolves. So it's very important that with um, distribution data for large carnivores that we separate between the total distribution and that distribution of the regular permanent or reproductive elements of the population. Um, in the early days of working on our distributions, it was very much sort of an expert process. But now that we are kind of deep into the 21st century, we really have come into the era of citizen science and the era where digital applications are transforming the way that scientists can interact with a wider public. Um, just about every country has one or more forms of web-based or app-based interface in which um, anybody, whether they're hunters or naturalists or simply regular people going about daily life, can actually register observations of wildlife. Some of these are designed for all species, other ones are targeted to certain species groups like large carnivores or certain um, groups. But in principle, there are so many ways now, both nationally and internationally, that anybody can contribute information. That we really are looking at a new kind of revolution in the possibility to conduct these large scale surveys on a continental scale. Um, when it comes to monitoring numbers, this is a totally different game. Um, it's very important to separate between two ways of coming up with numbers. One is where we have kind of statistical estimates, which kind of um, cover the uncertainty. So that if we say we have, say, 50 bears, we know that it's not 50, but it may be between, say, 45 and 55. In other cases, we simply have counts where we basically have um, counted up, okay, we have at least say 50 bears, there may be more, but we don't have any estimate of what we haven't found. Um, in, in, in scientific projects where we're working on smaller study sites, we always aim to come up with estimates that we really want to have that statistical measure of the uncertainty. But when we start kind of trying to survey large carnivores, especially on national scales and continental scales, for many species, we end up with some form of count where we at least have a fairly solid minimum number, but we don't have that formal statistical estimate of the uncertainty. So it's, it's quite important just to keep these two different things in mind here. But the, over, the transition from doing estimates to counts is very often a consequence of upscaling from a science project to a national or international monitoring scheme. When it comes to numbers, there are many numbers. But I guess the three techniques which stand out um, as the most common things in Europe now are camera traps. Um, it's DNA, normally extracted from scats and from hair samples. And then snow tracking is still really important in Nordic and Baltic areas where we still have snow, even though that's getting harder and harder in the face of climate change. Um, so the other questions here is that it's sometimes very difficult to estimate everything. So while in the Nordic areas, we try to often say can cover the whole country every year, in other countries, they may sample some smaller areas well and then extrapolate to the wider area. Um, there's also an awful lot of new statistical tools emerging which are making that type of transition easier so that the tools available for us to use different types of data and to mix data, say intensive data from reference areas and more extensive data from wider areas is becoming a whole new field of scientific research. So we really have more and more tools now for this. The other decision that we often have to make is do we try to monitor the total population or just the reproductive parts of it? And in many cases, especially again in the Nordic and Baltic countries, we really have focused mainly on monitoring the reproductive part of the population that we don't have an estimate of the total number of males and juveniles kind of running around the place, but we simply focus on quantifying how many reproductive units are there. That could be wolf packs, it could be breeding bears, it could be breeding lynx or breeding wolverines. This is really a consequence of the effort needed to monitor everything and simply practicality as well. Um, so the question is who, who should be engaged here? 
And if we are going to rise to the challenge of quantifying the number and the distribution of carnivores across a continent, this cannot be done by scientists. Scientists have a role, but to really get anywhere, we need a desperately, well, we are desperately need an involvement of a broader public. We need to have the wider public in here. We need to have key stakeholders where the hunters are central. We need to have networks of trained observers, there are foresters, there's game wardens. It's really effort that needs everybody to take part here. Uh, last year, we actually just did a review on the role of hunters in monitoring biodiversity across Europe. And this was sort of a minimum estimate of what we were able to, to track down, but it really illustrated how for virtually all species groups of wildlife, hunters were really heavily engaged in monitoring in some form in pretty much every country in Europe. And the things that they were monitoring was incredibly complex. It was data on distribution, on abundance, on reproduction. Hunters were contributing genetic samples. They were contributing tissue samples for disease monitoring and for studying physiology. So it was, and morphology and even movement. So there's a huge amount of information coming in from hunters. So from like a, a Nordic point of view, it's, it's obvious that the hunters are going to be a key partner in monitoring large carnivores and other wildlife. But I think there's sort of a bit of a gradient in Europe um, in the realization and the appreciation of the potential role that hunters can play. I think as you head further to the center and south in Europe, it's not quite so much appreciated, especially maybe among the conservation community as to how much potential for productive interaction there is here with this really important stakeholder group. The, the key thing about hunters, which I think really sets them apart, is they basically are everywhere. That there's hardly any square kilometer of the European landscape which is not part of somebody's hunting area. And it is not only like in the sexy, spectacular national parks and nature reserves, but they're also spread across the whole landscape even in the more boring parts where maybe researchers and naturalists don't go. So I think they really have a unique position to contribute here. But if we're ever going to really come up with data which is kind of scientifically robust, there's a couple of things that we really need to think about. And one of these is the issue of data validation. That simply a kind of a report that I saw something that might've been a wolf it's interesting. It gives you sort of a starting point for maybe the following up that work, but it's not really a validated, robust record. And I think it's essential that we really get across this idea that data quality and validation is important. Um, and the other thing which is important is that nobody is beyond being questioned. Nobody is such an expert that they do not deserve to be asked that question, are you sure? Can we believe you? Are you certain? Can you prove it? This is something we all have to get used to, that all of us are able to imagine things, we're able to misidentify things, and we should be very open to being questioned. So it's really nice if data is actually in a form that can be verified, such as a photograph from a camera trap or a DNA sample. The other thing that's important is data transparency, that we have to be able to see where data comes from. And there's nothing worse than people saying, there's more animals than everyone thinks, I've got my observations, but I'm not going to tell you. Or else there's some type of magic black box where this number jumps out and no one can see how it got there. So linked to this, I think it's a very important thing in the data flow in monitoring, is that we really have to separate between the different stages of the process here. And at one point we have the observations where the public or anyone can observe things. These need to be validated, but the interpretation of data and turning the number of observations into an estimate of number of individuals is something that should not really be done by the observer. That is a technical scientific job that really needs to be done at a centralized level. So Jürgen is trying to give me the hint that I should be finishing up here, but I just want to end with one anecdote about where it can all go horribly wrong. In Norway, in the 1970s and 80s. People collected all sorts of observations of bears, stuff in the newspaper, reports from people, whatever. And these were very uncritically plotted onto a map. And they came up with an estimate of 160 to 230 bears in 13 populations with 41 reproductions. 
what actually was probably behind this is probably no more than 10 or 20 bears. Because basically they had uncritically accepted observations as being bears, even if they weren't kind of verified. They had totally underestimated the ability of one young male bear to cross hundreds of kilometers and be seen by many people. So just because you have one male bear walking through a district doesn't mean you have populations everywhere it goes. So simply, they really did not have a scientific basis for making the transition from number of observations to a population. And the problem is this data was actually published in scientific journals. And it took maybe 15 years of reanalysis and more critical thinking about it to really get people to understand that what they saw was 200 bears was probably around 10. So it can go very wrong if you make wrong assumptions, if you are not critical about data, and if you really simply don't ask the, the nasty questions. So rounding up, I was saying that the surveying carnivores is an essential activity. When it comes to distribution, everybody can help. When it comes to estimating density, this requires a much more structured approach, right? This is something where people can contribute, but it must be part of an organized national or regional scale program. And the methods, how it is actually done, will vary very much from place to place and species and species. So the following talks are going to give us examples from wolf, lynx, and bear as to how things are done in different places. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, John. You warned us that you could talk for hours, <laughs> but thank you very much. I think we have had a very clear overview of what the strengths and weaknesses can be, but also of uh, what best practices uh, could be when we involve uh, stakeholders. And as you said, uh, we are now uh, having three examples of monitoring schemes in different countries, Sweden, Germany, and Switzerland. Now, we are not going to take questions after each of the presentations, but if you would have questions, please put them in the question and answer section, and then we will address them during the panel session. On top of that, as a participant, you have the possibility to vote on those questions, making them more or lesser important and giving us an aid to see which of the questions should or should not be answered during the panel session. Now, the first one I would like uh, to present uh, on the case studies, country studies, I have to say, is Jonas Kinberg from the Faculty of Forest Sciences. He's working for the Department of Wildlife, Fish and Environmental Studies, UMEO, and Jones has a very long-term expertise, especially on brown bear monitoring. And so his presentation will also be specifically, specifically on the monitoring of bears in Sweden. Jonas, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can see my presentation and good morning to everybody. Uh, I've been working on bear monitoring in Sweden for the last 20 years and been uh, involved in, in both methods that I will present. Uh, a little bit background uh, of the brown bears in Sweden. The status is that the, the, the current status is that it is designed as near threatened. It's from 2015. Uh, the bear management plan says that we need at least 1400 individuals in Sweden. And if the numbers is below 2350, uh, there is a need of at least one reproducing immigrant per generation. And the generation for bears is about 10 years. And that means that we have the bear that must come in from the Finnish uh, Russian population and reproducing in Sweden. Uh, we just conducted a study uh, that shows that we are well above that level. Uh, so, so that is not valid at the moment. It's also a huntable species in Sweden. And the hunting quota the last couple of years has been about 300 uh, a year. So uh, it's valued as a, as a hunting species as well. During the mid 19th century, uh, there it was an extermination of large carnivores in Scandinavia and almost all populations were more or less depleted. This is the harvest numbers from the mid 1980s, 1850s uh, up to current date. And we can see that the population in around 1930 was just a little bit about 100 individuals and they were located up in the Alpine areas in rest populations. The population slowly grew 
And today we have a distribution uh, in Sweden about of two thirds uh, of the area. And uh, the dark, dark one here is the same as, as uh, John was ta talking about before. It's the reproductive part of the population and the gray ones are more sporadic occurrences. Today's population is about 2,700, 2,800 individuals in Sweden. Uh, for most of the slides, I will also have bears in Norway since we are sharing some of the same monitoring system and databases. But I will mainly talk about the Swedish part of the population. We use two different monitoring methods. Uh, mainly for population trends, we used effort corrected observation from hunters, what we call the large carnivore observation index. And we estimate population size from uh, uh, collected scats and using DNA and putting them into a capture mark recapture system for estimating population size. And it, in addition, we obtain data on age, sex, location, weight, tissue samples, hair, reproductive organs, um, diseases, and other things for all hunter killed bears or all bears that we that are, are dead and they are uh, stored in database at the Swedish Veterinarian Institute. The Large Carnivore Observation Index uh, was introduced uh, in 1998. It's an add-on to an established method for moose monitoring that has been going on uh, since the mid 80s. And uh, it's the hunt reporting observations during the first seven days of moose hunting. And they add information on, uh, apart from the, from the moose and different moose groups, sightings of adults and cubs of bears, length of a hun daily hunting activity and number of hunters uh, per hunting unit and day. And that gives the effort. So we can combine or compare these observations in neighboring areas since we have an effort corrective. So it's not just a count of observations, it's observations per hour. And the number of observation hours that we get from the bear area is over 2 million observation hours. So it's a huge effort conducted in the bear area, uh, but the same system is in use of all over Sweden. So it's in total almost 5 million observation areas. All data is stored in the common database, builddata.se, uh, and it's uh, run by the Swedish Association for Hunting and Wildlife Management. We use the large carnivore observation index to measure population trends. We get data from every year, but we can also get distribution, of course. And what we also can see from this is uh, the expansion of the population, since we're also measuring this large observation uh, index in areas where we currently don't have bears. So we will note this when we actually will have a population. But bear observations are rare. Uh, and that means that we need, need a lot of effort for making any uh, valid estimations. We need at least 100,000 observation hours to make a, a conclusion. And that means that we can do this just for larger areas. And on average, being a hunter sitting still out in the forest, it takes over a 1,000 hours before you actually see a bear. So it is a rare occasion, even if you are quiet. And, and actually are there to try to see something. We have worked on this scientifically and we have a good correlation with SCAT surveys. So we compare two different methods to, to, to validate this, this system. The big advantage is that this is a really small effort for the hunters. They already do this for the moose. They use the same form and database and methods. And we have almost a total coverage of all current and potential habitats in Sweden with this. The other methods that we are using is non-invasive sampling of DNA. And that's optimist optimistic sampling of bear scats during the autumn. Uh, the big advantage here is that that is the moose hunting season when we have 200 to 300,000 hunters out in all bushes to, to actually do hunting and they can in addition collect scats of bears that they find. And during this time of the year, bears eat a lot of berries, so they produce a lot of scats and it's easy to find them. Uh, 
the berries also seems to preserve a DNA in the scat. Uh, so it actually has a higher degree of actually being a successful extraction of DNA. We started this in 2001 and we survey large areas. Uh, we can see from, from this map that we, we have large areas and they are on average sampled every five years. So we have estimates for each of the regions every five years. And in each of these sampling events, depending on the population size of the, of the area, it's collected between 1,000 and 5,000 samples. So it's a huge effort that the hunters are actually participating in. The county boards are respons responsible for the administration together with the central management unit or laboratory. Uh, the hunters organizations help with the information on planning on these events and the hunters uh, provide time, location, and uh, everything is put into the database uh, called Rubase, that is common for both Norway and Sweden. We use ext extraction of DNA uh, for species identification, uh, identification of sex and individual, and we compare that with a database of known individuals. So in total, we have collected more than 35,000 scat samples, and uh, we have over 6,000 different individuals in the database. But going from the number of found individuals to population estimates, we use capture mark recapture methods. And we used close population models in program mark that is freely available to estimate the total population size for each area in these different events. I will give you an example from Rubase. There is two versions of this, one that the manager are putting all the data in and one that drawing from the same data is available for the public. So I did a small search in the public version for data between 2015 and 2018 of bears and you find all the analyzed bear, bear individuals in this area. You can click on them and get information. And in this case, I clicked on, on this round uh, point and it actually contains data for 1000 individuals. So we can actually move into this and look a little bit closer to when we zoom in and can take and, uh, this data a little bit more in detail and actually click on the identification of a bear. And then we can actually see where this bear has been found different places over different years. So we have all this information in the database. To get the population size for Sweden, we combine the DNA estimates from each of these five years with the population trends from the large carnivore observation index. So we project data from example, uh, Westerbotten, uh, this area up here in 2014, with a, um, with a trend for the observation index in that area to get an estimate for 2017. And that's the last estimate we did for this, or the latest. And we estimate the population to be uh, about 2,800 to 2,900 individuals in Sweden with a rather small confidence interval to, to this. We also get data from uh, the bear hunting. And the hunting season starts the 21st of August. And with more bears, uh, the quotas has increased. It gives more specialists of hunters who are really interested in, in hunting bears and they get trained dogs. So it, they become more efficient. And, and now usually the hunting quota of 300 bears is, is over, over a, a less than a week. For the future, we will work on open population spatial capture recapture methods. So we will combine data from the monitoring, information from the dead recoveries, all the dead animals, and we can actually make uh, estimations over several years. And we can not only get uh, estimation of numbers or population size, but also density. This is a, a recent publication uh, with all the data attached that can be 
looked into more detail, but for management perspective, this is very useful that we actually can get, get densities for different areas. And we can do that. Uh, we have estimated the, the population uh, backwards for this. And this is the Swedish and the Norwegian population and the total. And we can see that the estimates for 2017 is very close to the estimates that we did with a closed model. So it actually works quite well. And as I said, we get estimates for each of the areas every year uh, based on monitoring data and, and uh, information from shot individuals. So the hunters, uh, are really important and involved in both of these methods that we use for bear monitoring in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, and the advantage of using hunters is that they are well educated. They have to take tests and, and a lot of information about species and other things. And we, we get the really good uh, hit rate on the collection of scats and other things because they know how these things look like. They are in place. Uh, they are out there uh, in, the, in the forest at the, at the right time, and they are accustomed to providing data and knowledge uh, for the management using, not just for large carnivores, but also for huntable species like ungulates and, and small game. Another crucial thing is that all the observations and scat collection take place during normal hunting when they are already out there. So they don't need to take an extra trip out to the hunting area uh, so it's something that they can do, do when they are already there. And I think that is, it's also a very important thing when you time uh, where and when you will do your uh, monitoring. All the data that we have are stored in national database. They are quality controlled and uh, by managers. And the calcul calculations of estimations are made by central units, units involving managers and researchers. All the methods are scientifically validated. So we actually have uh, worked on it and, uh, quite a lot from a scientific perspective to make sure that these are actually valid and that we are providing figures that are scientifically sound. The communication part is extremely important. Uh, it's not just information about the monitoring and taking place, but also the results and the feedback to the hunters and other stakeholders involved is in, in this uh, monitoring. Another thing is that you have to have transparency. Data and results are available online, so people can go in and check the information. And it's super fun for the hunters to find the scat that they sent in and see that this is from a, a bear female that was actually found four years earlier in, in another survey in a in neighboring uh, county. So that gives a lot of trust into the system. And the participation in these uh, methods gives ownership of data and higher acceptance of the results in the different communities. So I think this is a very successful collaboration between hunters, management, and researchers that uh, is not just working for the Swedish part, but it's also um, very similar in Norway, uh, but also in, in, in Finland where they have a partly different methods. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Jonas. And I'm now going to make the switch from bears to wolves and a switch from Sweden to Germany. And we have with us uh, Ilka Reinhardt, he's director of the Lupus Institute, one of the main organizations involved in wolf monitoring in Germany. And in Germany, what is specific is that all information on monitoring in all of the German states is freely shared on an online portal, uh, the Federal Documentation and Consultation Center on Wolves but Ilka is certainly going to tell us a little bit more about that. Ilka, the floor is yours. Okay, I'm sorry, do you hear that? 
We do hear you and we see your presentation. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, I'm going to present what we do in Germany um, for the wolf monitoring. And um, the wolf came back to Germany in 2000 before we had 150 years no wolf, so no experience with the species. And in 2007, 2008, the wolves began to spread over the country. And um, as Germany is a federal country, we consist of 16 federal states. We then had an urgent need to make sure that the data that are collected in different federal states are um, comparable. So at the pretty early stage in 2009, we were asked to develop monitoring standards to ensure this data comparability uh, on a national level. And um, we did that um, by looking what other countries are doing. So we, um, we asked colleagues from all over Europe uh, how they are doing and then we um, we wrote down this, uh, this monitoring standards, and this is basically um, there it's explained how data are evaluated. So it explains what is a C1 and a C2, so a hard fact or a confirmed observations, which data we need to confirm the presence of the wolves, and which data we need to confirm um, how many packs are there and what is a pack, what is a pair, all these definitions are wrote in uh, this monitoring standards. And what becomes more and more um, important while the population is breeding, we have uh, strict criteria how to differentiate between neighboring uh, territories. So, and with the aim is that we have a yearly, uh, so far we have really a yearly assessment of the area of occurrence. So where we have wolves in Germany and a yearly assessment of a population size in form of an index. So um, we don't estimate the individual numbers that I will show you in a minute. It's um, so far not possible for us, but we um, we count the reproductive units, so the number of packs and the number of pairs, so how many mature individuals are there that can um, that can reproduce. And once a year we have this area of occurrence map all over the of, all over Germany. So each of uh, green square, 10 by 10 kilometers square, we uh, have at least one C1, so one hard fact, like a camera trap picture or wolf on that. Um, and uh, the black dots, they, they represent areas where, where reproduction was confirmed. It is uh, to show the difference from areas where wolves are just dispersing or roaming through. Then the other thing what is produced on the yearly base is the um, uh, distribution of packs and pairs and in number. So we want to know how many wolf packs and wolf pairs are there in Germany. As I said, we don't aim to calculate the individual numbers. That, uh, that would be much, much more effort and the data collection is done on the base um, on the federal states. So each of the federal states is doing its own data collection. And then at the end of the year, we have the, um, the aim to compile this data to our national data. So how are data collected? The basis for this is mainly a present science survey. So people going out on forest roads and searching mainly for scats. If we have a sandy area or if you are lucky to have snow, we can search for tracks. Um, the problem and an increasing problem is we have hardly any snow. So we really rely um, on a year round data collection um, as, uh, yeah. To, to find this. So we have a focus on summer to 
look for some um, signs of reproduction. And in winter, we focus more on collecting genetic samples. In addition, a very um, uh, helpful method that's used a lot are camera traps that are normally placed in areas where you have an accumulation of uh, wolf signs along uh, forest roads. And this is uh, mainly used, or most reproductions, wolf reproductions in Germany are proved with camera traps. So by just um, pictures of small pups. And in addition, what is very, very necessary is um, genetic analysis. So um, to tell apart neighboring packs, mostly, so without genetics, we would not be able anymore in many parts of Germany. And of course, it gives some interesting uh, information about where the wolves uh, come from, dispersed, and so on. So these are these um, these three three methods: present science surveying camera traps and genetic analysis is done in an active monitoring, and then of course passive incoming data um, are used as well so chance observations people just um, that have seen a wolf or pictures from camera traps that for instance many hunters have out in the forest uh, are used genetics from dead wolves um, from livestock kills and so on and so on and i will show you as an example how it works um, in, this, in one of the federal states. It's the same procedure in all federal states. So during the course of the year, all these observations are collected um, with this, um, different uh, types. And they are evaluated if they are C1, so if they are hard facts, um, for instance, of course, uh, a dead wolf or a good um, picture of a camera trap can be a hard fact, uh, sketch can become genetic samples and so on. Or some samples can become confirmed observation C2, like sketches that are um, well documented. So at the end of the year, we have a bunch um, of data and for the monitoring or for the area of occurrence maps and for the calculating or counting the number of packs and pairs, we use the C1, C2 data only. So what you do is to put all your data on a map and then you already see where you have uh, uh, wolf presents where wolves were present in the last monitoring year. The yellow dots are C3, so that might be just observations without a picture or a blurred camera uh, trap picture. Without this, you have the, um, the area of occurrence. So that is pretty straightforward. And even a single C1 can, um, can occupy a grip cell. So if you have, if we got, um, for instance, camera trap pictures um, or a DNA sample um, from an area that will just occupy a grid cell. So that is the easy part. Um, where these yearly maps um, are coming out from. But then the tricky part uh, starts because we want to know how many packs and pairs are in this area. And this is extremely difficult, especially in areas like this, um, where they are really um, occupied by wolves. And this is the end result. But to come to this picture, we need all information that we had uh, collected in the course of the year. So you need the genetics, you need the camera trap pictures, that wolves, all this is analyzed together to find out how many territories are there. And in areas like this, the most difficult path is to uh, tell adjacent territories apart, if this are one or two territories. And to make it more complicated, this picture changes from year to year. It's not two years in a row where this picture looks the same. 
So wolf territories are not static, so they are changing. Yeah, some wolves take over neighboring territories. Um, some offspring try to squeeze in uh, in their parents' territories. So um, and what is often what we see for the public heart to understand that in, indeed we really start each monitoring year again trying to set up this puzzle together to figure out how many packs and pairs are in an area. So, um, as I said, what you need in areas tightly packed by wolves are strict criteria how to tell them apart. So, um, what we do in Germany, as I said, it's a minimum count, and John Linnell already explains the um, difference between estimation population sites and minimum counts. We so far still do a minimum count. One of the reasons is that the monitoring scheme and the monitoring effort in the um, different federal states is very different. So it will be, we will probably, we would have a huge um, confidence interval if we would just do an estimation. So at this base, we still um, think it's, we get more robust data to do this minimum count. And that's what we do. So um, for telling neighboring territories apart, we have different criteria how this can be done. And mostly we, knew, we use either genetics, um, so we try to identify in each of the territories or in as much of the territories as possible, we try to identify the breeding animals. If you know the breeding animals, um, then you can, uh, you can rely on, you know which pups are belonging to them. And you can say, okay, in one forest complex, there are other um, wolf parents than in the other. The next thing is, uh, the next more important thing is to, if, we, if you have a proof of reproduction in summer, so if you have young pups um, in, in summer in two neighboring areas, so you know there are two territories and not just one. So these are for, um, for becoming or for counting the number of packs and pairs the genetic sampling and the camera trap pictures of small pups in summer are the most important data source. Um, so this puzzle is every of the federal states is doing it during the year, and of the end in the end of the year, um, it does the calculation or the estimates based on the monitoring standards. How many packs and pairs are there? and if they have um, single resident wolves. And at the end of the year, um, the, um, the, the scientists from the federal states that are responsible for the wolf monitoring, they come together and uh, compile these data. They present the data and the data are discussed and evaluated. So at the end of the year, we have a national wide um, number of packs and pairs and this national wide distribution map um, for the whole of Germany. So these data are made public as well. So you have, we have the website uh, where all, for instance, all confirmed wolf territories are put in. And you can even have a look in while clicking on the territory, you see who the parents are, how much pups they had in the in this monitoring year. And you can uh, go back and see the history of this pack or the history of the federal states uh, of wolf occurrence. So um, because we do it each year, we have the data over all Germany uh, for each monitoring year. And um, yeah, that's how it is done. So when it comes to stakeholder involvement, um, of course, everybody is welcome to report wolf observations um, 
that is uh, was from the very beginning. Um, so everybody that calls and say, I have seen a wolf or sent in a camera trap picture or sent in a wolf sketch. So all these observations are of course counted and put in the databases. And every of these observations is important to, to set this puzzle together. And even sometimes people say, oh yeah, if I just have seen a wolf, but not taking a picture, this is uh, worthless. It is not because we need these observations uh, to, to get an idea that for instance, in a new area, wolves are establishing themselves and if we get, um, for instance, three phone calls from people that say, I've seen a wolf in an area where we hadn't one before, then you can go there and uh, search if you found something um, like skets or tracks and so on. Um, what it's very valuable if it's made available to the monitoring are uh, camera trap pictures. Many, many hunters have camera traps out there just for observ observing um, game species. And um, so these pictures are very valuable if they are um, sent in for the monitoring. Some hunters do, um, others don't. So that is, uh, would be, um, of course, uh, a big potential if we could use these pictures more. And Ilka, Ilka, yeah. can I ask you to come to a conclusion? Yes. Just, thank you very much. Okay. And persons that are um, especially interested and really become actively part in the monitoring, of course, they can be trained. So we trained a lot of persons and some training is done in the um, single federal states again, and then be uh, really taking actively part in the monitoring and becoming a person that is, um, that is uh, collecting actively science. So what we see is that many persons are interested in wolf monitoring and in the results. And what we also see, and that is not a case of hunters, it's of all interest groups that it's, uh, we find it quite difficult to keep people motivated um, to contribute again and again, not just once, but uh, and to understand that this game is uh, starting every year again. And um, and it's many people are interested in pictures, like camera pictures or taking pictures themselves, but um, much less are, are interested or stay interested in collecting genetic samples, what it's really uh, important for the wolf monitoring. So we welcome everybody and any contribution from whoever is out there and um, we think that especially if we can get more use of the camera trap pictures of, uh, that are out there, especially of small pups in summer, that would be very, very valuable. And uh, if we could um, convince people to collect more genetic samples, that would be helpful as well. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ilka. Um, I'm now going to switch uh, to the links, and we are switching uh, to another country, uh, being Switzerland. Uh, so we will have a talk on links monitoring in Switzerland, and for that we have uh, Fridolin Zimmermann, and he's working for CORA, a foundation coordinating large carnivore-related research projects in Switzerland. And already since 2002, Fridolin has been responsible for the links monitoring in Switzerland, so we have an expert. Please, the floor is yours, Fridolin. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Uh, can you see uh, my presentation? Yes, presentation okay. is in presentation mode, and we do hear you. So please go. Yeah. On. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, a few words about the lynx monitoring in Switzerland. So first I would like to present you the methods used and the coverage. 
Then I would like to say a few words about who is involved in the links monitoring in Switzerland. Then I would like to conclude with challenges and opportunities in building and maintaining a monitoring network. So regarding the methods and coverage, so uh, as John already mentioned, you know that large carnivores are occurring over very large areas. So you cannot sample all areas with the same uh, very robust methods. For example, for links, it would be camera chatting. So we use a stratified monitoring. So it's a system with different levels of spatial resolution and that each level will deal with different questions. So for example, at the lowest level, it will be the level of a study area, or we call this uh, area as a, a reference area. We will, will have uh, some information we will collect. Uh, so the question will be, what is the abundance? What is the density? The demography also, if you conduct uh, these uh, surveys, the camera chapping surveys over several years, you can then have some, some information about demography. And also, if you do it over several years, trends. And for this, we use, of course, um, uh, active methods like opportunistic camera chapping. There you can have a minimum estimates of, of individuals. It depends also on the effort. And also the so-called deterministic camera chapping, where you uh, set a camera chat to estimate the abundance and density of links by means of capture-recapture analysis. Then at level three, you have the management compartment, where management decisions are taken in Switzerland. At uh, level two, uh, this is whole Switzerland. Then here we will more look at, uh, yeah, where do, do, do links, do, do we have new links occurrences? Uh, also, we would like to monitor distribution with and without reproduction. Population size, this will be upscaled from very robust estimation in so-called reference area. And we try to extrapolate that on uh, over the suitable habitat that is occupied by the species in the management compartment. And then by adding all the abundance over whose, the whole suite, over whole Switzerland, we will get some information about the population size. We also will collect damages to livestock at the national level. Also health and genetic monitoring. All dead links are uh, sent to the FIV in Bern and they are screened and also tissue samples are collected for genetic monitoring. And of course, if you collect this data over several years, you have also some trends. Here more, here we will collect more passive data like collections of chance observation, dead links, livestock killed, and also opportunistic camera chatting. So just uh, briefly, the, the different uh, passive data sets that are collected in Switzerland. So you see the links found dead or the young orphaned or links caught and put into captivity. This is one data set. Then the livestock killed, so to so for the owners of livestock to get the compensation, it, uh, so the, the the dead sheep or the dead livestock need to be confirmed by trained people. In Switzerland, these are mainly game wardens, and of of course, then also the chance observation, live sightings. As Ilka also mentioned, often now a lot of people have pocket cameras; they can also make a picture, tracks, wild prey remain, prey remains, scats, and also vocalizations. Then uh, I come to the opportunistic camera trapping. What do you mean by opportunistic camera trapping? Is that you set uh, the camera trap when a good occasion arises. The good occasion is really when you find a fresh link skill. We know that the links come on feed for several nights. If the links is fresh, they come, come, come to the kill up to five nights. You can get uh, some information also about reproduction as in the picture uh, below. And also, you can also collect some information about links that uh, are stock raiders. And uh, maybe you know we have a Swiss links concept, and there are some management criteria when the links can be removed if it causes too, too, too much damages to livestock. But in some areas, we have very few kills that are reported. And there, we set the traps along trails. So it depends on the intensity of the surveys, how many people are setting camera traps, but you can have minimum estimates of links because uh, links can be, uh, sorry, you the, I think the, you don't see any more the, the presentation, huh? Um, we still see the presentation, uh, it's back in presentation. It, okay, right? sorry, it, I escaped the mode, I don't know. Uh, so yes, um, you can have minimum estimates, but you can also some, uh, have some information of the presence of links um, over a given period. This could be important for genetic 
analysis for the for, for paternity analysis. Yes, and uh, also this information uh, can be used, for example, for translocation program to select an appropriate links. And all this, uh, yes, this quite useful approach. And you can also involve a lot of people because uh, humans have a, yes, have a visual curiosity and uh, camera trapping are really appealing. So here, just a map to show you what we do then with all this data. We classify them according to the scalp criteria. And you see that we are also collaborating with the neighboring countries to plot now the distribution map. Uh, here, in the, it started in the Alps, uh, but then it was extended to the Dinaric Mountains, the Jura Mountains, where, where you see here, also the Vosges Mountain, also the small population that was reintroduced in the Palatinate Forest and the few occurrence in the um, Black Forest and surrounding areas. Here we apply also the, the scalp criteria already uh, mentioned um, by Ilka, so based on their validity, on verifi verifiability, so hard facts, uh, confirmed signs of presence will be C2 and unconfirmed signs or signs that could not, cannot be confirmed will be C3. And here at the top, we plot the reproduction and then, uh, then at the lower level, you will have all other signs of presence. So here, what we also do is the deterministic camera trapping. So the aim is really to estimate the abundance of links and density by means of uh, photographic capture recapture analysis. Links have a really a distinct code pattern and this code pattern does not change over uh, during the life. So you can recognize this individual over the whole life. Just an example of uh, with a big spotted links, uh, B87. And so what we do, we have now so far um, um, uh, conduct some survey in 10 reference areas. So then we have 16 management compartments in Switzerland and we have now uh, so far sampled 10 uh, management compartments in Switzerland. And uh, just to give you an idea, this is for the management compartment Siemens Sane. It's about uh, 1,200 square kilometers. We have 79 sites, and we sampled the area for a duration of two months. And uh, then we set, of course, two camera traps at each site to picture both flanks of each links because the code pattern is not uh, symmetrical. So now, who is uh, involved in the links monitoring in Switzerland? So there, there is, uh, as John also mentioned, it's, there is a formal um, uh, request or so the Bern Convention for Switzerland. We are not part of the EU, but also the Habitat Directive. And in Switzerland, we have also legal requirements like the uh, hunting law and the Swiss links concept. So the, the Foundation Cora carries out the national monitoring of the large carnivores on behalf on, of the Federal Office of Environment and the Canton. And we are compiling, storing, and analyzing all the monitoring data. Um, then, uh, yes, the, our network. So we have a network of observer and reporter. So the game wardens, they play really an important role. You, you will understand more why in my, in my next slide. We have also sometimes volunteers that are engaged like hunters and we call them natural, naturalists. We have also, of course, the general public. We have some forms on, on our website where they, they can, can be filled in and they, where they, they can announce um, uh, links observation or any large carnivore op observation. And we have also the wildlife office that are involved in the monitoring. So maybe just uh, to clarify an, an important aspect in Switzerland that is we have two hunting systems. There is one canton without any hunting is Geneva in red. And we have then uh, cantons with license hunting, the green one, the dark green one, and the canton with hunting grounds, the light uh, green one. So in canton with license hunting, the professional game ones really play a central role. Really, they, they have their network and people know them and they will often send their, their observation to them that first and they will go in the field and validate the observation and then they will report the observation to us. The network is, of course, there are hunter among their network, natural nature lover and also the general public. Whereas in uh, the, the, the hunting, the cantons where, with hunting grounds, the no or few, there are new, no or few professional game wardens. And there, of course, the hunters generally are more involved in the monitoring of large carnivores. And I would like to give you an example, a case study that was conduct, conducted in the canton of Solothurn, where hunters are really involved in the monitoring since 2007 or even uh, previously, 2003, when we built up a monitoring network there. 
So maybe just to give you some background information. So the hunting parties lease the hunting crowd for eight years. So they, they need to pay a rent and then the financial income from the hunt goes to the hunting parties. And the thing what happens, there was a controversy going on, it started so 2001, 2003, the links uh, increased, the links number increased, and um, yeah, the acceptance of the links decreased because, you know, uh, the, the number of game in some hunting grounds decreased and due to links. And of course, then the income and the emotional value of this hunt uh, decreases. So then the local authorities, so the Conto of Solator wanted to find a solution so that, uh, yeah, the, the main goal was to create and maintain a good acceptance level of, of, of links among the hunters. And the solution they suggested is a monitoring setup based on financial incentives and volunteer hunting staff. And it, this system was established in 2007. So then there are 10 trained hunters, so-called links responsible. And uh, they assess, they are called, for example, if the colleagues have a wild prayer remains in the, and find some in the field, they need to assess it in the field. They can decide if it's, uh, yeah, if the, the link is fresh enough, they will install also a camera trap. And also they have some camera traps set along trails uh, all along the rear and they check them on a regular basis. So, um, so every link that is detected by a camera track is then identified by us. And this added, is added to a links pool with a given financial contribution. If you are interested, you, I recommend you to, list, to read this unfortunately in German through 2017. The more detail can be found there. And there, at the end of the year, you end up with a links pool. You have about 70,000 to 100,000 Swiss francs a year. And these are then distributed to the hunting parties of the corresponding hunting ground in which a links were were actually detected based on the distribution key. You see here a map, it's based on a GIS project. More details can also be found in Struch 2017. And what they also did is that they built um, um, a links group uh, where you find, can find representative um, from hunters, but also from NGOs like WWF and uh, Pro Natura to foster the dialogue and favor the dialogue between hunters and conservationists. And just um, what you, uh, yes, to come to, um, to provide to you some information about uh, the success of this um, links group of this system is that thanks to this monitoring setup, the information is level is really very, very high. So for example, when we do some deterministic camera chopping, all the links that are uh, detected during the deterministic camera chain, so this is really a robust method, they were already known, most of them, from the monitoring conducted by the hunters. And also the acceptance is, is also good, even so the density is quite high. We have no cases of illegal killing recording since the implementation. So also the volunteers, there's another, um, yes, a monitoring where uh, volunteers can easily be involved these are so-called deterministic camera trapping. So where you, we estimate the abundance and density of links uh, by means of uh, capture-recapture analysis. So here it's really up to the local authorities on the canton to decide if hunters should be in, uh, included or not. The local game ones, some, some are used to work with, your, uh, with hunters or not. And we do not uh, tell them what they should do. They need to decide if it's worth to, to, to work with them or not, and uh, it's really there's some, some yeah. Each uh, everybody is different and has his own way to to involve people. Um, and uh, yes, um, we had some, for example, in, an example in the canton of uh, um, Uri, where uh, members of also from hunters, the game wards, and WWF were involved in the in the camera trap uh, checking. And what was in also interesting is that if you uh, integrate um, different interest group, you could also favor the dialogue between these, these interest groups. So just maybe just uh, what is required to maintain a, a monitoring network. So what is important is of course that professional and volunteers must be trained in the identity field science, use of equipment, how to report the data, how to collect data, which form should be used. And also they should be informed about the methods on uh, reporting use. And then, uh, the, especially for, with camera trapping pictures, 
you need to have really uh, remote access to, um, to data storage. Then also the many monitoring network member need to, be, to get the feedback. They should be regularly informed about the use and the information of the data they have uh, submitted, the results of the monitoring program on the methods. You need to acknowledge them in the reports. And what we also do in the deterministic camera trapping, we provide them a CD with all the best picture of the, all the, 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 um, the, yeah, the mammals that were pictured and they like it very much. So also mentioned also several times by my colleagues is to ensure a transparency, uh, transparency. And for that, we have a monitoring center where all our data are made available to the stakeholder decision makers and the public. And maybe just to conclude the challenges and opportunities in building and maintaining a network. So what we see is when we involve uh, volunteers on the general public. So you have, of course, organizational aspect, especially that the funding need to be available for long-term studies. Then also we have problems related to data collection and integrity. So we need, you need training, the, you can have online training uh, now that is available, for example, for camera trapping. Then of course the management, the use of data, the motivation or commitment of volunteers that this was already mentioned by Ilka. Uh, monitoring is a never ending story. You need to keep, need to monitor, to motivate your, your network. And then you have also some data protection issues. Uh, this is uh, especially relevant for camera trapping. Uh, as a coordinator, you are responsible if the, there are breaches in the data protection. And uh, then you could have need to have a very restrictive protocols which could impact uh, the sampling design and finally the results of your monitoring. And final, finally also the uh, decision that will be taken, the management decision that will be, be taken. Additional challenges um, that um, are um, uh, encountered if you involve hunters is that hunters who participate to the monitoring, they are sometimes seen as links lovers by their peers and seen as treaters and excluded from the group. It happens to us or to colleagues. And also there is also sometimes the wrong idea that if you participate to the, to the monitoring, this implies management, but this it does not imply management. The management base is in Switzerland is based on the management criteria defined in the Swiss links concept. And then of course, there are also some opportunities that was mentioned also by my colleagues is that you can cover very large area. For example, we could not uh, do the deterministic camera trapping without the help of all these volunteers and among us also the, also the hunters. And uh, this is not only, we don't only do not do, we do not only do that for resource reasons, because we also expect that um, the engagement of um, stakeholders, uh, by engaging stakeholders also, they will more accept uh, the result because they collect them also, they contribute to the collection of the, the data. And they should also be more, the chance should also be higher that they will accept also the management decision that will be taken from the analysis of, of these this, uh, results. And uh, of course, we, what we also expect is that we can uh, favor the dialogue of the different interest groups. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Fridolin. Um, we have now had three examples from three countries uh, with the monitoring of three different uh, species of large carnivores. Uh, but in reality, uh, large carnivores do not stop at the border. So there is some need for cross-border monitoring. And that is going to be exactly what we are speaking about in the next, a slightly different example from Klaus Hecklander. He's a professor at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. And in addition to his academic work, Klaus is a very active member of the CIC and also a, a member of the EU Large Carnivore Platform. So he is now going to talk about his work examining monitoring schemes in the Carpathian and cross bordering monitoring this time. Klaus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jürgen. So, so now you should see my screen. Yes, screen that, notice. that is the case. The opportunity to talk about this uh, challenging uh, project. Um, it's about the Carpathian Mountains. And as you know, the Carpathian Mountains, they are uh, the second largest um, uh, mountain system in Europe covering an area of 210,000 square kilometers. And uh, yeah, it's cross-bordering because there are seven countries. You can see them here on the, on the map. It's Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, 
Hungary, Poland, Ukraine, Romania, and Serbia. And these uh, Carpathian Mountains are really a large carnivore hotspot. If you see the figures which were presented by John already uh, in the early talk we had this morning, uh, the Carpathian uh, bear population is about 7,600 individuals, which means that it's about 43% of the uh, European Union um, uh, population or the Europe population, depending on which uh, calculation you take. Uh, also with uh, wolf, uh, it's quite a huge proportion. It's 21% of all wolves in Europe. They live in the Carpathian mountain system. And with lynx, it's about 39%. 39% of all lynx monitored uh, with the Large Carnivore Initiative Group of Europe is inhabiting the seven countries of the, large, of the, of the Carpathian uh, mountains. So large carnivores are quite important for biodiversity uh, in the Carpathians. And there's a Carpathian convention. And within the convention, there's a working group of biodiversity. And in October uh, 20th of 2016, this working group um, uh, supported a declaration. And there's one uh, citation from it. We call for the development of an international action plan for the conservation and sustainable management for the Carpathian populations of large carnivores, which will implement the relevant provision of the Carpathian Convention and Protocols, as well as the relevant recommendations of the Standing Committee of the Berne Convention. So the uh, members of the Carpathian uh, Convention, the seven states, they are aware that they have to collaborate and that they have to find standards uh, in, in sharing data, especially for, for large carnivore uh, management. And uh, as sustainable management is involved, uh, CSC comes on board, and there is a memorandum of understanding be between Carpathian Convention and CSC. And the objective of this um, memorandum of understanding is to enhance the capacity of countries in the Carpathian region in conserving and sustainably managing wildlife resources. And the main scope is identifying, documenting, and disseminating successful experience and the best practices on management, conservation, and sustainable use of wildlife. If you talk about sustainable use or sustainable management, uh, especially uh, for large carnivores, then we should, of course, base our management on reproducible and transparent methods to estimate population status. Well, if you go to the seven Carpathian countries, then of course you have some challenges uh, about large carnivore monitoring uh, in these countries. And one example is given in this box um, that reports on population status are available in English, but only in the five European Union countries. So not for Serbia and not for Ukraine because they're not members and they don't have to report according to Article 17. And the methods of monitoring are available in the national languages only, if at all. So in some countries, we uh, have no description, written description of how monitoring of large carnivores is done. So the rationale of the project, uh, which I would like to present in short, is to describe all current national large carnivore monitoring procedures in English for the first time, compare the pros and cons of national methods and picture future perspectives, and discuss minimum standards for a Carpathian-wide population estimation. So the first results, if you talk about methods, they vary extensively across the Carpathian Mountains, from snow trekking to hunting bag analysis, everything in between, including also genetic sampling. And they changed rapidly over time in line with scientific progress. Uh, for example, non-invasive genetic sampling is spreading also in the Carpathians, so numbers are difficult to compare between the years or decades. Uh, the methods are evaluated based on scientific projects only in some countries. So although some methods scientific proof that the method is appropriate to give transparent and reproducible numbers of uh, 
um, uh, individuals of lynx, bear, uh, or wolf. And there's a lack of reproducibility in most countries. Most descriptions remain vague. And methods are in some countries the result of more than one source from different institutions in charge. In some countries, we have ministries and NGOs working in parallel, but not together. And in some, we have national parks responsible for the data collection. So there's a lack of communication. We are just trying to compile all these data in a written report, which should be finalized in this year and provided uh, in, as open access uh, uh, in, in the internet. So for the seminar today, the question came up, are hunters involved in monitoring? Well, the hunters are not involved in the Czech Republic and Hungary, where monitoring is managed by an NGO or by a protected area authority, respectively. The hunters are involved in all other countries where monitoring is coordinated by state authorities, by the Ministry of Environment, by a hunting department, or by state nature conservancies. However, in most countries, Hunters are not supervised by institutions in charge. So the training of the hunters to provide um, appropriate quality of data observation is always uh, in, in question and not given in all countries. Hunters are not fully recognized as reliable sources due to intransparency of methods. So hunters don't trust the authorities, authorities don't trust the hunters in some of the countries. And this is because of a lack of communication. So no database which is open for everyone uh, and which is, um, which is describing what has been found in the past by hunters or by the authorities. And the hunters' estimations are not classified based on scout criteria in most countries. So there's a big discussion on whether the data are true or not. So the recommendations regarding the use of hunters is, first, we have to improve efficiency. We have to use hunters as sources as they are all over the countries and usually have deep insights into their hunting grounds. It would be inefficient to, negotiate, uh, to neglect these uh, sources of information. Then, of course, we need reproducibility. We have to train hunters to monitor large carnivores using minimum standards over these seven countries. And then, of course, there is a need for confidence building, involve hunters in data interpretation and reporting. Of course, this should, should be done by scientists, but there should be always a backup and a cross-checking with those which provide data. Even if these three uh, recommendations are fulfilled, we have still in the Carpathians some general challenges. Uh, in terms of methods, there is an agreement on minimum standards uh, difficult to achieve as methods differ between countries due to different traditions. Of course, they depend on the large carnivore densities. Le they are less accurate when abundant. And uh, then we have, a call, of course, also impact by the conservation status. We have more precise data when the species is strictly protected. Another challenge is the coordination. The estimates given by the national countries neglect habitat use across administration units or national borders. So as, as an example here, you have the lynx uh, in Poland. And in the report, they say, OK, these are not really Polish lynx. They are shared with other countries, like with the Czech Republic, with Belarus, or some of the Baltic uh, region. And then mapping. Not all countries provide occupancy in 10 by 10 kilometer grids. So is not available in uh, Czech, in Serbia and in Ukraine, for example, those two countries which are not reporting to the European Union. However, the countries which are um, working on, on in improving their methods, like uh, Serbia and um, uh, Ukraine, they are thinking beyond uh, these, these uh, challenges because they want to get members of the European Union on working hard on achieving these minimum criteria for, for good standard uh, on, in large carnivore uh, monitoring. So 
Uh, that's all for now. I, I would like to thank all the national focal persons, Martin Strat from Czech Republic, Boton Bako from Hungary, Rosena Hasek from Poland, Georgetta Ionescu from Romania, Slavomir Findo from Slovak Republic, Vukan Labadinovic from Serbia, and Andrei Taras Bashta from Ukraine. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to thank you, Klaus, for this presentation. Now, before we start the discussion, um, I would like to give the floor to the webinar organizers, FAS and CIC, uh, to give you some more context on their specific interest in monitoring schemes and the specific involvement of hunters. I will start with uh, FAS, and it will be Sabrina Dietz, who is the wildlife policy officer at FAS, uh, and she is also coordinating uh, FAS's work at, uh, on large carnivores at the European level. Sabrina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see it. We do see your screen. You still have to put it in presentation yes, mode. Yes, I'm trying that. Takes a while, good. No, that's working, excellent, please. Yes, so good morning also from FACE and thank you very much for this very interesting and insightful presentations about different large carnivore monitoring schemes um, in different parts of Europe. So I want to start again with the question why uh, the discussion about monitoring schemes in the framework of the large carnivore platform is so important. I mean, back um, in 2014, when the EU large carnivore platform came into force, um, many uh, or most of the European uh, large carnivore populations were still way smaller in, in size and range. So now, uh, countries need to learn again how to do monitoring where the large carnivores just returned, but also um, in countries where large carnivores have been already a long time or even never disappeared. Even in those countries, there are still some, some conflicts um, with, with monitoring. And in general, monitoring is so important because authorities, they require those reliable population estimates um, to, of course, define conservation and, um, status and management decisions on one hand, but also to justify them towards stakeholders and people that are influenced by those management decisions. And quite often, those estimate, estimate size of population size, they lead to debates and, and discussions. And if there's then a lack of uh, transparency, this often um, causes disbelief and frustration amongst the stakeholders. So I want to um, explain a bit more what hunters expect from large carnivore uh, monitoring. And I think FACE and its national members, we want that management decisions or conservation um, decisions are based on the best um, available data that's based on, on scientific evidence, and we want to have a certain transparency in this process. And um, we do agree that the ultimate goal of monitoring should not the, be the satisfaction of, of hunters or of other stakeholders, but um, in fact the production of uh, the best quality data to, um, to generate the best possible management and conservation uh, measures. So um, in August uh, of this year, um, I circulated a survey amongst our members um, on how, hun how hunters feel they are involved in the monitoring of wolves. So that's only for wolves, not uh, large carnivores in general. And you can see that, yeah, especially in Northern countries, it's, uh, they are feeling strongly involved um, in the monitoring. But there are also some countries, um, especially in the south, where they feel that they are not involved in the monitoring. And this leads in those countries quite often to, to conflicts concerning um, population estimates. 
So what can we do or how can we repeat um, monitoring schemes that work well with, with stakeholders in other countries? Um, and what could be the potential limitations to successful, successfully involving uh, stakeholders in the monitoring schemes? And I think we heard many of those points already, but um, of course, um, the reporting of not reliable or not credible data is, is a problem. But also quite often, there are lots of data available, lots of observations available in um, collected by hunters or other stakeholders, but there's just not a good tool or system in place to, to collect those vast amounts of observation data. Then in some situations, there might be, as Klaus already explained, a lack of dialogue between stakeholders and authorities. So that there are different data sets um, available, um, but there's just not a communication between stakeholders and the responsible authorities. And then, of course, as Klaus already said um, as well, the scale of monitoring. Many large carnivores need to be monitored over different regions and, of course, also over uh, country borders. And then another thing is, even though um, in, in some areas there are very good monitoring data available, there's quite a lot um, quite in quite a lot of situations also a lack of the clear targets. So um, according to European legislation, um, in this case, the Habitats Directive, um, the, the target is to achieve favorable conservation status for population assessments. And uh, to help to clarify those, um, those target and the favorable conservation status, um, national member states can use uh, the so-called favorable reference values for population size or range. But um, when you look at the last reports, only nine assessments calculated um, favorable reference values for population size. So we need to ask us the question on, on how many individuals um, yeah, should be enough or because that eases a bit the frustration. Um, so stakeholders or people that are influenced know a bit um, where, where the target is. Um, hence, there is a clear conflict between um, the ecological caring capacity of habitats and uh, the social caring capacity we, which, needs to take in, uh, which needs to be taken into account. Um, we have, for example, the um, situation in Poland where the Polish assessments of wolves are unfavorable, even though um, the wolf population has grown exponentially over the years. But the argument why the populations are, or the assessments are unfavorable is that the, yeah, the population is still growing and expanding, so the favorable reference values is not reached. Um, yeah, even though wolves are now all over Poland, so having their a clear target um, helps for sure easing um, a bit of the frustration among stakeholders. So uh, what can we do now to, to change the situation? And I think this webinar is already a very good step in, in building uh, the cooperation and trust among stakeholders um, so that uh, stakeholders better understand how, how gener um, population estimators are gen uh, generated um, and that um, and how it is done in a transparent way. And I think also for stakeholders, it's especially important to to understand the chain of monitoring uh, from field observations to population estimates and then to the final numbers and figures that are reported by the governments under Article 17. Um, so what could be the next steps and what are the main uh, milestones? We are now um, in the beginning of a new um, reporting cycle, uh, which um, is from 2019 to 2025. So we have the chance to, um, to try um, different things. We can increase the transponder cooperation, which is so important since many uh, large carnivore populations are nowadays uh, shared by one or more countries. 
And already um, only last week, the European Commission confirmed again that transboundary assessments of large carnivores are possible and even wished for. And that's um, especially interesting for countries who share only a small part of a population. Um, and um, yeah, for example, in the Netherlands, it's already a good step forward since they use the same monitoring scheme as Germany. So their uh, joint assessments could be possibly um, tried out. So to summary, uh, to summarize my presentation and to give a way forward, um, I first want to start with the fact that monitoring is first of all, not about whether um, populations can be hunted or not. So it can bring stakeholders and authorities together on, on a different level, um, on a level that's maybe less delicate that, than um, certain other management decisions. I also want to emphasize that for, for us and hunters, but also for other stakeholders, I guess it's a transparent discussion um, about population estimates is very important. And I want to highlight again uh, the immense and knowledge and resource hunters uh, hold. Um, we have heard uh, a lot about camera traps that hunters are more and more using on their hunting grounds but there are also um, new technologies available such as um, applications for phone. And I'm very excited to hear about the presentation from Hunters & Co uh, with CIC about a new promising application. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sabrina, to give the perspective uh, from FACE. Uh, we will also ask uh, now the Tristan uh, Breyer from CIC, and he will talk about ideas on how stakeholders can input data into monitoring schemes. Now, Tristan Breyer is involved in developing apps for hunters and is the ideal mm -hmm. person to give us a little bit more information on how to use data from stakeholders. Tristan, floor is, is yours. Excellent. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me just share my screen. Two seconds. There we go. Stop. Right here. Uh, good morning. Now for something completely different. Um, um, as already mentioned, I am the uh, partner manager for Hunter & Co. Uh, and also I uh, collaborate with the CIC where I'm the vice president of the youth part of the organization. And also I assist FACE in communications. Um, um, basically, um, we are a private company based in Munich, uh, founded in 2018 by Lawrence Frey Hilti and Marcus Ortmann. Um, as an app which basically aims to uh, take away, sort of digitalize all the organization of the hunt before, during, and after. Um, this includes event management, live and driven hunts, diary of, of, of hunting, recording your harvest, recording sightings, recording every possible amount of information, and to be able to share these experiences among users and among hunters. Um, in Germany, we are known as Um The rest of the world, we are My Hunt, and in the UK, we are My Field Sports. Um, um, overall, since uh, we were started in 2018, we currently, as of yesterday, have 352,000 uh, downloads all throughout Europe, uh, and we only launched in in the rest of Europe uh, outside the Dach region in. May of this year, so since then have grown exponentially and are continuing to grow very rapidly throughout Europe. Uh, we've increased by 100,000 users since July of this year even. And as you can see in the German speaking regions, we hold on average a 25% a market share or 23.45, um, which also means that we are collecting a huge amount of data uh, from the entries from the points of interest from the sightings, we are collecting an extreme amount of information, uh, all very detailed um, by location, 
by animal, by um, age, by weight, by um, um, by and also includes the weather data and any post any conceivable amount of information which is included in there. Um, we have partnered with many of the leading organizations in Europe, including the, the CIC and FACE, with whom we have a very strong uh, collaboration and partnership, as well as many private organizations uh, who support us, uh, Subaru Mitsubishi, Gotha, a large insurance company in Germany, Franconia, a large retailer, Zeisica, um, uh, Camera Traps, uh, who are the largest German producer of camera traps, and we are currently working on integrating them into the app, um, which, uh, will allow us to also collect the camera trap data. Uh, and there will also be an option for users to be able to make this data available for scientific research as well. And additionally, we have partnered with many of the na national, local and regional magazines and are in talks and in the process of partnering with many of the local, national and regional associations throughout Europe. And as of 20, 2021, so the second half of 2021, the rest of the world. Um, what can this app do for wildlife research and for monitoring and in this context specifically um, large carnivore monitoring? Um, this data which uh, we are also aiming to have sort of be qualified and, and have confirmed by, by more users and the, the uh, distribution of animals to report and track of it um, over multiple hunting areas from multiple users, but also um, sightings when, when hunters are, or harvest when hunters are in different areas around the world. Um, additionally, we are looking to integrate a wildlife traffic accident feature, uh, which will allow users to sort of report wildlife traffic accident, which if you are familiar with the, the Waze application, which is quite popular in the UK is a sort of um, route mapping application allows different users to sort of um, confirm information so that a, a sighting can be confirmed by multiple users before it is a, uh, a qualified um, data entry and all additionally to identify poaching and also to report and track diseases and the spread of diseases as well as to notify particular users in a particular area or a particular radius um, of the presence of diseases. Um, the data, because we have such a large amount of users uh, throughout Europe, and um, this is increasing exponentially day by day, uh, we have a large amount of data which is collected by users using the app in a very easy to use way. It's one of the core points is that this, um, in comparison to many other apps, is that it's easy to collect because it, it's two or three clicks uh, when people are in the field or on the road and um, and by you know every different age group that the ease of use is very very easy. Um, we um, gather this data as well as the images collected by the users and and we attempt to anonymize it and and um, and using machine learning, uh, we develop algorithms which can link different sightings and harvests uh, to identify the movement of these animals over time. And as well, because we are very much an internationally focused application, also over borders as well. Um, this can help uh, identify and track the distribution of animals over time. Um, the expansion of the wolf, for, of the distribution of the wolf, for example, the spreading of disease and many other features. Basically any sort of data you can imagine we can collect. Uh, we are relying a lot and hope to work together very closely with the scientific community on which data we collect and how we process this. And um, this data, especially when it comes to uh, being utilized by associations, uh, we're able to, to make this data available in either a raw format for uh, the scientific and for research purposes, but also for associations and for other purposes, we can filter, well, obviously filter and anonymize the personal data, clean out the duplicates and make this available in an easy to use platform where um, 
where which aggregates it and is able to already identify patterns and double entries and make the data usable and um, and uh, rather than have to process a huge amount of raw data, it'll also already sort of have certain models built in and a constantly expanding series of models, which can also be shared between users, um, users on the association side, and um, we'll be able to, to um, yeah, um, incorporate a large amount of models, um, which already can certain can be used to test and prove certain hypotheses, which may already exist. Um, the weather, um, the 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 data is hyper local <clears throat> and includes the precise GPS position, the time, the weather data at a specific point, and many many other types of information. Um, very technically, this is sort of how the data is processed from the individual users to the um, um, to the um, platform, which will make available to the research community and um, and associations um, through our very secure servers. Um, it is first um, um, stored, secured, and anonymized uh, because obviously the privacy is very important for our users, especially for hunters. It is very important that the data is treated securely and, and made public without their express permission. Uh, so the data is anonymized and sort of um, will be arranged by a specific um, location and area. Um, then it will be um, transmitted to a um, a online platform where only um, authorized users such as certain associations or <clears throat> um, universities or members of the scientific research community will have access to it and and will be able to either process the data in a in a raw manner or be able to access the large amount of tracking templates which are uh, which will be available and which will also constantly increase automatically depending on the information and depending on um, the sets used from one country to another, and which can also be shared, as I mentioned before. Um, this data can be exported and can be used by all the tools which uh, are already in use. So we are able to make the data available in every possible way um, to integrate with systems already in place. Um, so if there already is a system for, for data collection available and for, for tracking data, we're able to uh, adapt the export of our information to be able to integrate seamlessly into that. Um, and so um, any user can use the information in the way that they want. Um, using very advanced tools like RapidMiner or Amazon SageMaker, uh, which, which use machine learning, they are able to already analyze this data and identify certain patterns across the continent and also across the world from, from next year. And um, these algorithms can and patterns can then be shared, um, also not with the end user community, but with the um, scientific community. So that every participant in every country and every association has access to the same amount of tools to be able to process the data. Uh, another very interesting feature um, is the survey extension that if certain scientific hypotheses can already can be uh, tested uh, directly, you can target a certain set of users in a specific location, in a specific area, in a specific region and, uh, and uh, define an idea into a questionnaire and link it to the relevant data and then ask specific users about um, this, this hypothesis to be able to prove it or to be able to, to qualify with additional data or to request additional data from specific users in a specific target group, as in mountain hunters across the Alps or across the Carpathians or a specific area. Um, in summary, we are currently the number one hunting app in Europe. We are the most popular and widely used. Um, we are very internationally and international, internationally adaptable. Currently, we're available in five different languages, and we're hoping by the second quarter of 2021 to be available in many more languages. 
Um, this is in comparison to much of a competition. And as, as John also showed in, many, in comparison to many of the more local and regional and national apps, uh, we are um, able to gather and provide data across, uh, across borders. Uh, also, we aim to be the sort of more universal tool um, for data collection throughout Europe. Um, and is able to sort of, um, because for a lot of associations, many of these smaller tools and many of these national apps and websites take up a huge amount of resources, take up a huge amount of, of time, money, and effort to create. And we are able to provide a universal platform to be able to um, gather this data rather than expand certain resources on, on, the, on the national level. Um, it's a, the system is very much research oriented and is able to provide an, an API for organizations, associations, and government. Data is usable, adaptable, and secure. The, the amount of possibilities are, limitly, are, are limitless on what we are able to collect. And the data is also reliable because it comes from users that use the app for their own individual purposes, but can be adapted to be able to request also data from them on for specific studies or specific purposes. Um, the data export, um, can, as I mentioned, can be exported in many different varieties and many different formats to be able to uh, connect to the tools already in place and can identify um, many different types of harvest sightings, movements, diseases, and much more. And the survey tool can extend the data and prove the hypotheses. And um, that and the reliability of the data um, speaks for itself. Um, and uh, can help, um, yeah, help promote the uh, sustainability of hunting throughout Europe. And should you have any further questions? Uh, please feel free to contact me at any time. That is it. Thank you, uh, Tristan. Um, you know more or less ready uh, to start our panel discussion. So I will, would like to bring together all of the platform members together, uh, together with the speakers of this morning. But in addition to our speakers, there is one person I still would like to introduce and we will be part of, uh, of our panel discussion. And that is uh, Raphael Hickish from the World Wildlife Fund he has joined us now. Um, Raphael will represent uh, WWF uh, on the platform and today on, uh, on, on the panel. Uh, but he is also the, the manager of a very ambitious life project, the Euro, Euro Large Carnivores, which has been examining coexistence across Europe. Now, um, Raphael, I would like to give you at least uh, a couple of minutes so you can shortly introduce yourself and maybe uh, say a little bit more about uh, your large carnivores. Please do so. Uh, thank you very much, Jürgen. I, I'm always curious to see um, well, all the fascinating work that is being done in the different regions. Um, but I also see a big problem in getting lost in a very detailed discussions many times when you look at the member uh, states that we have been working in and that the Eurolarge Carnivores project is working in. So just as Klaus has described, um, there is, uh, well, you have different protocols that base on traditions, that base on context, that base on cultural difference, differences um, that make it, seem as if you would need one unified concept in the future of how to do monitoring of particular species. And there have been proposals to do things in the same way and to use the same standard for a long time. Um, at least over the past 10 years, there have been several attempts to unify the way ways um, monitoring on carnivores is being done. Um, and I think we have there has been quite some progress which usually for on the NGO side it's difficult to um, recognize because this is a lot of things that happen internally and that happen internally in the processes how governments how European member states report to the European Communion uh, Commission and um, 
although there has been made this process, particularly with uh, the standards that are now being used for Article 17 reporting, um, I think it is uh, the time now to use uh, the uh, available statistic uh, or mathematical tools like Bayesian uh, harmonization of data when we know the sample effort to actually continue working with different monitoring approaches in the regions where everybody knows what works best for them, but documenting the monitoring effort in a way that can actually be used to integrate this data. Um, I think uh, John has already mentioned that there is new tools available and these Bayesian approaches, approaches is one way of, of doing that. And this is also what we are looking at or testing now for uh, wolf monitoring data across Europe, whether this can be already done with the currently different uh, monitoring protocols used in the countries. That's about what I have to say uh, for now. Thank you, Jürgen. Okay, thank you very much, Rafael. So uh, we have Rafael, we have uh, the other members of the panel, which will be Sabrina from FACE, Christian from CIC, John from the Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe, and of course, we have our speakers from this morning. Uh, you have the, uh, still the possibility to ask your questions in the question and answer box, which you will find below uh, the screen uh, of the Zoom uh, webinar, so please, feel free to ask your questions. We have had a number of questions and I have seen that our panelists have been very active and have been answering most of them already. But anyhow, there are still a number of questions which I would like to bring back uh, to, the, to the audience as they are uh, having interesting information uh, for all of us. Before doing that, we have heard this morning that the importance of involving stakeholders in monitoring depends on the type of data that needs to be collected. Um, we are speaking specifically about hunters, but also all the stakeholder groups uh, can be part of such monitoring schemes. And the question I have is, under what circumstances should we involve stakeholders? Is there always a place for stakeholders or should we involve them at the specific uh, circumstances. And I would first like to go to John uh, to answer this question. John, are you willing to do so? Well, I, I can take a, a, a shot at it. I think um, there's always a place for stakeholders, right? And um, in, in our kind of research, you know, kind of, we involve stakeholders in many ways. Like we have hunters who run our camera traps, we often involve local people in snow tracking and radio collaring and many different things. So there's many, many ways that stakeholders can be involved. Um, I think the more that you can structure their involvement, the more that you can gain from it. So that can kind of obviously just by kind of say kind of contributing distribution data, anyone can contribute in a non-structured way. But if you're able to come up with a much more straight structured data collection, then you can gain much more from the involvement. Even though I, I don't think we'll ever get to the stage where we can standardize monitoring across Europe, you know, because we, we all have our local landscapes and snow conditions and cultural conditions and practices. So we can never, I think, achieve one approach across the continent, right? We will have to have local variations but we can hopefully maybe standardize within populations at least. I think that should be an achievable thing. And certainly we can put in place some minimum standards, which can ensure that data quality at least is above a certain threshold. Okay, thank you for that. Now, if we go specifically into hunters as a stakeholders group, how would you answer this question now, Klaus? Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, those countries uh, which consider hunters as a source for, for information, um, they, they are more efficient because uh, they use the available resource, namely the people on the ground. Um, the, the, the other question which you um, brought up is uh, about quality. And I think one of the main uh, lessons learned from the Carpathian Mountains is that we have to work on teaching um, and instructing and supervising these sources, these hunters, 
uh, in providing uh, appropriate data. Um, and I think this will be a, quite a big uh, challenge as, uh, you know, first you have the, um, the hunters which are not convinced that this is something valuable for them. And then you have the, the authorities which don't trust the hunters because they, you know, they give some figures, they, they maybe some higher figures than they uh, see. And so this, this distrust which is there, I mean, uh, takes some time to get rid of. Therefore, I think communication is one of the most important steps which we have to bring forward. And communication means that we have to bring people together, those which are in charge of doing the monitoring and those which might provide data like, like the hunters. And I think uh, it's, it's a challenge which differs between countries because some countries are doing quite well already. Um, uh, and others are far away from being using these these uh, these sources, these hunters. And I think it's it's something which takes years um, maybe to bring together, uh, for example, the the seven Carpathian countries on a minimum level, which allows us to provide maps which have the same quality of uh, um, data um, uh, um, collection. Now, building further on that, uh, Raphael, um, there are some nature conservation organizations uh, which are very experienced in bringing together their members to do uh, nature monitoring. What do you think also for nature conservation organizations? Are there specific circumstances where stakeholders, I will turn around the question, should not be involved? Uh, thank you, Jürgen. I think it's very important to distinguish the mandate of each institution that is involved. If you have a situation like in Switzerland, where um, the national government uh, gives the mandate to uh, an organization like CORA to carry out monitoring on the national scale or to integrate data, then um, it makes a lot of sense to see uh, the, the organization, the nonprofit organization, as the managing authority that involves all the stakeholders um, that are on the ground. I think that's the most important that people are uh, on site, be it hunters or be it veterinarians or other, um, uh, other groups uh, there. Uh, I don't think that you can uh, primarily say there, should, there is a group that should be excluded or their uh, involvement should be excluded per se. As uh, was said in the beginning of this webinar, one has to distinguish between the distribution and range, so contribution to knowing about distribution and range, and the value of contributions in knowing about density and uh, population size. And one should not create the expectation um, that, for instance, occurrence data that is reported by hunters will then define the population size so that there is no misunderstanding which uh, kind of conclusions is made from which contribution by which stakeholder group. Okay, thank you. Now, I would be very much interested to know, let's say, and I will go to the three speakers of this morning who presented the three national cases. Um, and they are also representing the monitoring of three of the large carnivore species, bear, wolf, and, uh, and lynx. Um, are there for you certain circumstances in which you would say, here I would prefer not to have a stakeholder involvement, or do you prefer to have always a stakeholder involvement in monitoring? First of all, the monitoring of bear in Sweden, uh, Jonas. Yes, I, I, I can't really think of a, a situation where you are not going to involve stakeholders, but I think it's very important to find a specific rule, a role for them to, to participate. And it can be a data collectors or, or um, information or planning or make the best use of it. Uh, and it's, I think, for, for most, most things, I, I think there will be a role for, for for hunters or stakeholders in, in this. But I'm a little bit afraid also, we see them as a, as a huge resource, uh, the hunters, but what we are very careful about because they, they, they are participating in a lot of different 
and monitoring methods, both of large carnivores and ungulates and, and other things, is to make this sustainable over time, not to, to keep the interest up and, and not just uh, ex uh, something exciting for a few years, because we need data over time. So I think it's important to also keep that in mind to, to, to find a sustainable role for them in, in different parts. Okay. And Ilko, how is that uh, in Germany with, with, with wolf monitoring? Uh, are there circumstances where you say maybe it's not it's better not to have a participation of stakeholders or there too you would say no there is always a place for stakeholder involvement in monitoring yeah i mean it's it's the same like you not said i fully agree so in um, um indeed we need more people involved in in data collection urgently so it's um if it comes to data collection, that would be very, very useful, no matter if it's Hunter or not Hunter. It's, um, and we, we try to do so. So we train people that are interested to, uh, to become part, not only, I mean, what I said, it's everybody can contribute data, just everybody. If I see a wolf by chance to have a picture, so everybody is, but if I'm more interested and say, oh, I, I want to be part of the monitoring scheme and uh, regularly do something, um, you need people to be trained how to recognize wolf signs, how to document wolf signs that the, sign, the data are collected are, can be used then. And so we do that and I have not number, but I think probably most of the people that we trained are hunters or involved in hunting, foresters and hunters. <laughs> so, but it's, it's as even Jonas said as well, it's, um, it's difficult to keep up the, the motivation to do it in the long run. So that's, that's, I think it's the most part. And that's why I thought maybe the easiest part is the, um, the data that are out there anyway, even if I'm not actively involved in monitoring and this are all the camera traps data, if they could be made available and probably it would be very helpful to have some people in the hunting associations that are kind of like multipliers and, um, and stimulating the, the exchange, the, um, the discussion. So, um, because it's a lot of, if the more people are involved, the more work it is to keep track with everybody. But of course, um, it would be very, very helpful to have more uh, data from hunters and from other interest groups. Thank you. Um, and then Fridolin, uh, links in Switzerland, um, participation of stakeholders, always yes. a need or sometimes difficult. Always a need. I would say yes, we, we can always profit, but I think there are also some, uh, I cannot say if there are some political aspects as well, but uh, we work uh, with the, together with the canton and with the, then with the local game wardens. And I think we cannot define some general rules that say we need always to involve the, the stakeholders. Or maybe these this are some things that need to be discussed also with the cantons, also with wildlife offices and with the local game wants to see how uh, on how they can be integrated and if we integrated them. And maybe regarding the, the links, uh, we have also successfully invo involved stakeholders uh, when we estimate the abundance and density by means of uh, capture recapture analysis where people are uh, taking care of sites and so. And it's it's uh, so in, 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 the, in the links, not only we can profit from stakeholders from from chains observation to plot distribution map, but also when we uh, estimate the abundance by in, um, in this in these regards. Uh, and um, yes, we have we have we have uh, I think uh, uh, we have established a links group in the northern Jura mountains uh, because we had some issue about the links acceptance and there were some representatives from hunters and uh, from uh, from nat from naturalist and also from sheep breeders and at the beginning people were very motivated they could have a everybody could have a camera trap but uh, there was a turnus because we had not enough traps and uh, as my colleague mentioned with time this decreased and uh, 
uh, the interest decreased because you need to to still be motivated to check all these camera traps. But what 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 uh, what remained was really that we we had once a year a meeting where all the the different uh, members of the group from the on the different interest group came and we had uh, some information exchanges about uh, yes uh, some specific questions like for example biology or impact on on for example the impact of links on on, on praise. So uh, this 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 was was yeah um, th uh, this remained. But then the 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 number of people that were part participating decreased for the monitoring so it's it's quite difficult to keep this at the high level and i think the problem is often always the resource we need somebody that that coordinates this and and keep uh, and motivates the the network and this this is not always so so easy to do that and also so i think an important aspect is also the validation of all this the signs that are reported. I think this this is also something that I was wondering. For example, in the in the app that was uh, presented before, how the validation is going on. Um, yeah, this this is also a very huge uh, huge task. If you you get a lot of information, how you you validate all these these signs? Well, indeed, uh, validation is a is a very tricky thing. Uh, I know that in my in my past when I was still director of the research institute for nature and forest. In Brussels, uh, we checked uh, one of uh, one of the apps uh, on, uh, on on bird monitoring, and we came to the conclusion that one out of three uh, was not able to identify the bird correctly um, about validity. And then I maybe will first go to to John to tell us a little bit um, the validation of the data. Uh, how can we tackle that? Yeah. Sort of, well, in, in, in many of our Scandinavian contexts, the validation happens in the field um, using the state um, game rangers who are highly trained, at, for example, you know, skinning out dead sheep, um, following tracks and snow and, and, and that kind of stuff. So most of the field observations will be verified in the field. Um, the other thing is that the new techniques that we have open up for more automated validation. So like working on DNA based upon scats, then you're able to automatically include um, a DNA assessment of actually if the scat is actually a wolf scat or a fox scat and if the bear scat really is a bear scat. That kind of comes nearly automatically. With um, camera trapping, um, Many of us are sort of playing around with machine learning based um, systems to try to validate things. Um, I don't think any of us have these systems quite fully functional yet. And even if we have the algorithms, we haven't quite managed to integrate them into like an automated um, data processing pipeline. But there's an awful lot of work being done. So I would imagine very soon these things will be up and running and trustworthy and somehow integrated into the system. So a lot of this data validation stuff will be fixing itself in time. I would guess that the biggest challenge will always be around wolf tracks. But like a bear track, a lynx track, a wolverine track, they're all quite you know, qualitatively easy um, to recognize, but a, a dog track and a wolf track will always have this sort of um, potential for confusion. So I think that's where the conflicts are going to remain for a long time to come as to when is a paw print in the mud actually from a wolf or a dog. And again, that brings us back to what Ilka says is that the DNA stuff um, and the scats are really coming in. So while a picture of a wolf track is interesting, if you can follow that and pick up a scat, the value has magnified by 100, as has the whole issue of data validation. So I think we're getting there, you know, um, we really are. It can have, you can obviously never exclude the possibility of people falsifying information. Um, and that will always probably be a certain very, very small risk in some very special cases. But um, in general, I would say the new techniques are certainly going to take away a lot of the problem. But there will always be a need for good field craft. And, he, and here we need those trained and trusted observers out there who can really be that critical quality control voice who dare to take that conversation with the, the stakeholder and say, well, are you sure it really is a bear track? You know, have you really thought about it? Or is it a bad track that's melted out in the snow? So the will still need always to be fieldcraft, but the automated and the new techniques certainly help a lot. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Tristan, um, on validation, uh, your app is collecting a lot of information, a lot of data. Do you have a validation system? Um, you have to, oh, yes, Sorry. no problem. Yes. Uh, no, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, at the moment we are looking at implementing a validation system, uh, which can, in terms of sightings, be sort of multiple sightings verified by multiple users to, to be able to, to validate it. Um, however, uh, we are still in the process of developing the system and uh, are looking at uh, the more um, yeah, the best possible ways we can val val validate the data. Um, but there's many different options for this. Okay, thank you very much. Obviously, if there's multiple of the if the if there's if there's multiple you multiple hunters in in a single area and one um, you know sites tracks and one site um, scats and one uh, has a physical sighting or an image, obviously you can validate the data by by combining the multiple sightings into one uh, specific. Uh, set of data for a specific area. Okay, thank you. Um, I had uh, in the question and answer session, and then I go from validation towards transparency of data. And I had a question from Robin Rick, uh, who was speaking about an unusual situation in Slovakia, uh, where the state nature conservation authorities do not have or do not share results of research and monitoring wolves. And indeed, uh, sharing data is, of course, a very important uh, issue. Now, we have seen that uh, in Germany, uh, the website on wolves, uh, which uh, Ilka uh, presented, uh, is going very far in that. Um, Ilka, um, I can imagine that that's not an easy task uh, to put the data in a visual way available for everybody. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the problems you had uh, doing that in Germany? Yeah, it took a long, long time. Um, so, well, at, at the beginning was um, like there are some people that would like to have every data like on a daily basis online, like every data point and other people, other people say we do not know, uh, we do not want to have a data point online. So then everybody could zoom in and, and look where it is. So uh, at the beginning, it was the, the discussion about what is uh, the, um, the minor common sense, what we, what we have. And this is what we now see is the, the territories and the wolves found that. So there are, um, as soon as we um, as we confirmed them, they can be put online. But still, it's um, it's a matter of the federal states to decide. So we have federal states that do it in the during the course of the year, and only had, have at the end of the year just a few territories left that they still want to discuss. And we have federal states that do not um, publish their, their territories during the course of the year. So that's, um, that's a bit, a bit um, sad. Um, behind this, this map, it's a database. It's uh, where all the raw data are going in. So each federal state has a database, the same copy of a database, where everything from a sighting to a track to a scat, everything is going in, and uh, where you can give the scalp. So, um, yeah, the background is a database where the data are then, um, of course, still evaluated. And as soon as you say, yes, you have all data together, uh, it's connected to a genetic database um, so that we can. Um, Link the territories to the to the breeders and so on. Um, then it could can go online, but it was more than three years of work, and still um, the discussion is going on: what should be visible and what not. Okay, now, John, a similar question for you. 
uh, how important is it to be transparent about the data? Uh, I think transparency is everything. Um, because kind of like I showed in that kind of untriangle, you know, if you fall on one side, the whole thing falls down. So it's not just enough to be practical or to be scientifically robust. You have to be credible too. And transparency is the most important part of um, credibility. So you really have to have that information out there so people can go in and see how conclusions came about. You know, the um, Scandinavian approach is, I think, extreme in having the, um, like even the, the, the DNA profiles out there. And if, if people can do that, it's fantastic. I understand that in some contexts, like Ilka says, it may not be possible to have that level of kind of resolution out there, but at least there has to be a high degree of transparency with data out there online. Like we're in what, 2020 now, almost on 21. So there's really no excuse why databases cannot be accessible on the web. And so this to me, I think is the alpha and Omega of the whole thing that we have to have the information out there. Okay, but between the alpha and the omega, you have a lot of other letters. Is mm -hmm. there also a risk with putting things online? Because I had a question there of someone who says, "Okay, if if you put all of this information online, uh, is is there not going to be a misuse of those data? For instance, with wolves, people not liking to have wolves in their territory, uh, is there a risk that?" Uh, yeah, wolves will be killed just because they can find the data very easily. I very much doubt that any poacher is going to have to go onto the internet to find out that they have wolves living in their territory, right? So, and I don't think we're going to have people jetting across Europe to find a new place to go poaching because they see a dot on the map. So I, I think that is largely a constructed problem. What... Um, we, you would do though, is that you don't necessarily have to put things online in real time, right? You can have a buffer in there where you delay things and that's naturally gonna happen anyway. Like the camera traps are collected every couple of months, the data is processed, the DNA data is processed over time. So there's always gonna be some type of time delay, probably of weeks or months involved in putting things online. And that naturally takes away most of the risk of um, data being, being misused. The other thing is that, like Elke says, you don't maybe have to put the exact coordinates. Maybe you can put it into a grid cell or you can blur it or displace it by a random number just to give it a certain buffering. The exception here is breeding. And I think when we have um, evidence of reproduction, when animals are much more limited in their movements and much more vulnerable um, to disturbance, certainly there we probably do need to build maybe a bigger delay in inputting data online or maybe blur the exact location by slightly more. But um, so sure, we have to be a little cautious here, but in general, I think there's certainly some very simple techniques which ensure transparency without increasing the risk of abuse much. Okay, a risk of uh, abuse, uh, Sabrina, uh, from a hunter's organization scene, is there a risk? I don't believe so. <laughs> Simple, simple question, simple answer. Yeah. I think uh, monitoring data will not be used to to go for illegal killings. That's my opinion. Okay. And and let's say an organization like FAS, uh, are you making use of monitoring data? And if yes, how do you do that? I I think we do make, of course, use of monitoring uh, data basically um, based on the Article 17 reports, which uh, did determine certain, the, the conservation status of, of course, which is very important for, for management in the countries. And, and we, want to, we want to work together to, to better understand um, how certain uh, management decisions are made and how conservation statuses are, are defined. So of course we were tracking, monitoring, data of our national, yeah, of, of the member states in the EU. EU. Okay. Um, Klaus, a little bit on the same line. Um, what do you think? Uh, how far should we go with transparency? Uh, the whole, up to the whole end, or are there certain limits for you? I mean, a prerequisite is that 
if if you expect that hunters provide data, they of course expect that they get the results and the interpretation and the full report. Maybe they have much more right to get these data than the open public. Yeah. So um, I think it's very important to to have a trustable uh, relationship between those which provide the data and those which interpret and and map and and report on the data. Otherwise, it won't work. I mean, the best practice examples given today uh, from, from Germany and, and Sweden and also Switzerland, uh, they are best practice examples because of tra transparency. I mean, if, if you think about other best practice examples where everything is fine, uh, we won't find them uh, in, in case the, the uh, transparency is not given. So I think it's, yeah, as, as John said, it's the alpha and the omega i mean uh, this is this is something which we have to achieve if it is not there i mean from my experience with the carpathians um one of the the, the main challenges is really uh, given in countries where there is no communication anymore between the authorities and the hunters like like robin rick uh, in the question and answer session um uh, mentioned for for slovakia I mean, uh, to 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 fit this problem, wow, uh, it's it's a bunch of work, and um, uh, it's just working if you have pressure from the bottom and pressure from the top. So the ministries, of course, they should really work on on uh, convincing their their um, institutions to be transparent and provide, of course, the um, the resources to build up a database. And also, they sh should then convince the, the hunters and other stakeholders to provide data to this database. I mean, it's a step-by-step -step, um, uh, solution which we need, and um, the aim is clear. If we don't have the hunters on board, uh, the data quality will always be limited, especially in remote areas where scientists or NGOs are not um, uh, present. Where we need the, the the help of the hunters. Yeah. If 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 this is not the case, I mean this will be uh yeah, kind of useless and nonsense. Okay. We have been speaking about hunters as 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 doing the monitoring of, of large carnivores. I can imagine that there are other types of stakeholders who could be engaged. Um I will first go back to to, to John uh, as our as our scientists in the scientific group. Uh, John, what, what other type of stakeholders could play a role? I should start charging you per question here, Jürgen. <laughs> One beer per question I have to field. <laughs> um, I would say that one of the other key groups in countries where you have them are foresters, right? So not every country has like a forest service but in the countries that has them, they are certainly a very key stakeholder. In some cases, they overlap very heavily with hunters, but in other cases, they don't. So that would certainly be one very key group. They are sort of out there everywhere all the time. I think that the bird watchers are also a community um, that we can touch on. They are very used to using apps. You know, kind of you have an awful lot of people who are very addicted to filling out their sparrow observations and their magpie observations and woodpecker observations. And I'm sure they also see other animals. Um, farmers are certainly a group who could be involved here, especially um, shepherds who are spending time uh, um, outdoors. So again, there's obviously issues of needing to have data validation there because they may well have economic interests if um, compensation, for example, is tied to, to carnival presence. So like any a data provider, we, we cannot relax that kind of validation criteria, but certainly virtually everybody spending time outside, I think can make a contribution here. Okay, I would like to go, go back to our three uh, case studies we discussed and, and there for each of the speaker also asking uh, the stakeholders except nature conservation organizations and hunters uh, that are involved in, in the monitoring. Uh, Jonas, uh, in Sweden, are there other stakeholder groups? Yeah, I, I think it's we have opened it up for the public, both for general observations and, and collecting uh, scats and, and other things. But uh, 
the, the hunters cover a large part, but we, we don't exclude anyone. Uh, what we would really benefit from is to have a larger involvement from the reindeer herders, because they are in areas in, in, in Scandinavia where the hunters are not uh, as common, especially not the moose hunters. And in some reindeer herds, herding areas, uh, they are participating in the, this quite a lot. And in some areas, they, they are not, especially for bears, we, there it's quite scattered. So I think uh, uh, for bats, for the bear species, it, it could be in, in, improved, I think, to, for, for, um, for the reindeer herders. But otherwise, I think we have a good, good coverage of, of all the areas. Uh, okay. Now, I had uh, in the question and answer session a specific question to you, uh, whether you have uh, experience on bear data collection from providers of the touristic bear watch in Sweden. We don't have that many bear watching uh, areas, uh, so they, they don't really cover a big part of the, of the country or, or a huge space. So of course they can provide information, but it will be uh, in the same way as, as the, the other stakeholder groups, like uh, providing DNA and other things. If they would have been more plenty, of course, we could have used uh, multiple sightings or, or, or in, in individual identification of, of, of groups and other things. But uh, as it is now, it's, it's not a, a large en enough group to, to make any difference for the, for the monitoring. Okay, then I'm switching to, to Ilka uh, from Germany, uh, let's say with a similar question, uh, who is involved besides nature conservation organizations and hunters? Well, um, it's, so everybody can contribute, everybody. Um, so we don't ask if somebody is a hunter or a nature conservationist, but uh, what John said, it's, I can completely agree. The forest does are a very, very helpful group. So um, there are foresters involved in the monitoring, especially the um, federal foresters on the that's uh, taking care of the military training areas. So they normally do the monitoring on these areas on their own. They are trained, but it would be very helpful to have more of the state foresters um, engaged in the monitoring as well. But that would mean that monitoring would have to be part of their job description. That's for the federal foresters, for the trained person it is. So they are allowed to do, during their normal working time to uh, do monitoring. For the state foresters in general, might de uh, depend on the federal state, but in general it is not. But because they are outside so much and have so large areas to cover, they would be very helpful. Um, yeah, of course, livestock owners, but I honestly, I never met a professional sheep farmer that has spare time to do monitoring. Um, we have a few that have a few sheep at home that do so, but normally they are just complete full of work with other stuff. But yeah, I think foresters and, and hunters, I mean, for every dog walker who's regularly out in the forest, regularly out could contribute. So it would be cool if we would manage to get more from the just normal public um, to get more people involved. Okay. And then I'm switching to, to Fridolin. Um, all the stakeholder groups, again, uh, besides uh, nature conservation organizations and hunters, are they involved in the lynx monitoring in Switzerland? Yeah, yeah. so um, I, indirectly we get also the data from, uh, it's an app called ornitho.ch. Uh, these are the ornithologists that can, uh, now they can also announce the mammals and among other, of course, also large carnivores, but we, we get this data indirectly. So we are not really into the management of the whole system. So, and I, I think that we have a good network in Switzerland of, of, uh, for the monitoring of large carnivores, but, but for sure for the discussion, I think um, foresters, it would be great also if forester would be more integrated in, into the monitoring network because they, they play also an important uh, 
role in the discussion and the important uh, interest group in the discussion of the presence and, and the, the conservation and management of large carnivores in Switzerland. And by integrating these people, uh, we can also foster the dialogue between all the different interest groups. Okay. Um, John, uh, again, a question uh, to you to start a discussion on, on let's say, the, the methodology. Uh, we see that we have enormous technolog technological improvements in, in, in the last decades. Uh, we have scientific progress. Um, what do you think are the best monitoring methodologies today? Well, I guess it depends on context, but the two which always stand out are going to be camera traps and the DNA-based kind of monitoring from SCATs. Those are the two really big things that um, have been game changers in the last 20 years. So, but they are not everything, right? There will always, kind of, like I said, always be a need for those people who can actually recognize a track in the snow or in the mud. Now, you cannot have camera traps everywhere in the in the, the whole landscape. Like in Norway and Sweden, we're monitoring like what a, a landscape of combined, what maybe three, four hundred thousand square kilometers. So we're never going to cover Scandinavia in a grid of camera traps. You know, so so something simply cannot be upscaled, um, even if the DNA collection can be. So it will always be a combination. But just to underline scats, DNA, camera traps, those have been the game changers. 20 years ago, we didn't really have these. Now we do, and it's certainly opening up a new world. Plus the web, you know, and the whole kind of possibility for apps and registration on, online. We are moving into an era where the job that was once ins insurmountable is becoming certainly much more possible. Okay, and I have a specific question in, uh, in the question and answer section, which was asking, if you have genetic information, can you really go up to the population level? I think that's a question for Jonas probably to answer. Well, then we will switch to Jonas. Sorry, can you repeat that? I answered a, 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 a question online here. So, Yeah, well, the, 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 the question was, okay, we have more and more genetic uh, sampling and, and, and genetic research on large carnivores. But with that uh, genetic information, can we really make conclusions up to the level of the population? Depends a little bit on how it's collected and how much, of course. Uh, the, the DNA gave, gave us a, a very good resolution of an individual or the sex of, on, of, on the animal. But to, to transfer that into a population size, you, you need other methods. And, and uh, so the, the DNA is not just the solution to that uh, because this is just a counting of individuals. And what we are doing, we use capture mark recapture techniques. And you can use the same techniques for that with, uh, with um, cameras or, or other type of data. Um, so I think you need to introduce something more. Otherwise you would have sort of a total count and, and that's not feasible for, for most large carnivore populations. Uh, mostly for very small po population in the limited areas, I probably would work, but it's, it's a method of, of getting good data, but you need methods to do estimations after that. So I think it's, uh, it's just part of a, of a solution. Okay, Jonas, I will stay with you. Um, going back to hunters uh, taking part in, in monitoring, uh, what do you think, uh, where can hunters really contribute in the monitoring of large carnivores? I think uh, we, we do the most of the hunters in, in Scandinavia now. They, they actually are, they are out, uh, they know the hunting areas and they can provide uh, different types of observations or samples that can be processed further on. And uh, I think that's where we, we can use most use of the hunters and also that they are, and, and we don't need everybody it, it's better to have people who are willing and not forced into doing this but they, they should see some benefit with it of course and, and and the largest benefit i think is that they can participate and take take um, part of the results and information and most of the hunters are really interested in in not just huntable species but a lot of, of wildlife things so so i think it's uh, 
as I said in my, my talk, uh, not overdo it, but, but make it sustainable over time to, to use it wisely. Okay. And then I go back. Uh, okay. Uh, this webinar was specifically on the contribution of, of hunters uh, to monitoring of uh, large carnivores. Uh, Sabrina, um, what do you think hunters have to offer to the scientific community? I think the most important thing is, of course, the provision of credible data. Um, and it, just to be open for, for discussions also with other stakeholders, sto stakeholders with other authorities, um, to be able to, to understand better just the whole process from, yeah, as I mentioned in my, my presentation, from the field observations to then the numbers that are reported um, by their governments under Article 17. So if there's there's transparency and there's good communication, I think hunters are, are a very valuable source of information that should be taken into account. And it's uh, for sure not about hunting or not. This is about monitoring and we want to contribute to successful monitoring schemes. Okay, Sai, uh, as a member of the platform, uh, what is your opinion? How can hunters contribute to the monitoring of large carnivores? Yeah, I think we have a long-term interest. So there's always been for, in the countries where the large carnivores are going to be present. So we can really ensure this long-term um, heat because of resources are always restricted. Uh, ministries have their budgets cut, but there's a continuous interest for hunting in large carnivores, uh, whether it's a huntable species or not. I think it's the, the example from, from Sweden is a, it's a good example. The, the hunters are doing there during the first seven days of the moose hunting. So they're already in place. It doesn't require additional resources. But I think what we need to do is to understand how the data is being used for the management decision. So whether it's a decision to hunt or not, if hunters are contributing, the key is they know how the data will be used. So it's not just about having the information on the hunting, but knowing how this information will be used. And I think this goes for um, all different stakeholders, even also the ministries. We've seen um, in the reporting for Article 17 some um, pessimism. So because they're worried about how results will be used, they, they may give a more pessimistic answer, particularly for the future aspects. So we've seen that we see for hundreds of other stakeholders, they're concerned about uh, what's going to happen in the next few years. So I think having a bit more clarity on um, how information can be used, um, but also having more transparent systems. So that's going a bit beyond the question, but I think the main point is that we have this resource which is in place and which we can use for, for the long-term monitoring. That's okay. Um, Raphael, um, we are speaking here about data uh, from hunters to support policy. Uh, I can imagine that from a nature conservation organization's viewpoint, there is a certain risk in that. On the other side, nature conservation organizations are also providing data with which they are trying to influence policy decisions. Uh, how do you see that um, uh, stakeholders collecting data uh, influencing policy? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to distinguish uh, what we have already heard before. So we, we talk about uh, the need of transparency. We want to be transparent and we want to be somehow we want to somehow make sure that the time lag of sharing information is not too big. Uh, then we want to make sure that people have trust uh, in what is published. And we want to make sure that the, the agency, authority or organization that publishes the information has a mandate to do so. So uh, at the moment, this is very complicated because uh, we, we end up having a discussion like Robin just mentioned that the nature conservationists do withhold information or that the agency does withhold information. After all, there is a clear responsibility uh, in each case. Who has to take care of providing monitoring data, I would think. And the only point where we can currently see it is at the Article 17 reporting, which is only happening every six years or so. But there we see a clear responsibility. We know clearly who is the authority that provides information and we know to the extent uh, that is possible what was the reasoning behind doing that what was the scientific 
evidence underpinning uh, underpinning this uh, judgment. But um, yeah, where the data is contributed uh, by uh, NGOs to governments, be it hunters, foresters, or independent companies that collect uh, data and want to publish it with government or uh, share it with governments, uh, I think is uh, less relevant. As we have heard, the most important is that we have valid uh, information, that we have data that we can follow through and validate. And um, one other example of monitoring uh, large carnivores or large carnivore impact uh, that we haven't talked about today yet was about uh, livestock damage data, which is something that is usually collected by governmental agents, by veterinarians, or uh, yeah, it could be uh, hunters or protected area staff that, that does investigations of livestock damages. Um, and we see that there again, we have to acknowledge that the systems of collecting such, such information vary greatly across regions. And uh, as long as we don't have a trust in the agents that do collect these indications, as long as we don't know whether they have been trained or not, and how they have been trained, this data is of little uh, relevance. We always have to make sure that we have uh, trust in the qualification of the people that collect this information. Okay. Then uh, my last question during this panel discussion uh, goes to Sabrina and Sai. Um, what can the EU platform do specifically on this topic? Sabrina. Yes, I think this webinar is already um, a good step in the, in the um, good direction and maybe we can we can focus on the on the regional uh, platforms to initiate there are more really discussions and and um, round tables so that different stakeholders are uh, talking together about how to improve monitoring really um, yeah in the in the region at the local level and then yeah summarize the, the best best outcomes of those discussions maybe so i can elaborate Sai, so please do so Yes, I think we know, as we said, there's, we've just had reporting that's going towards the state of nature report uh, for Article 17. So we're now starting a new cycle. So there's opportunity within the platform to have, this is a regular discussion whether we, so far we've had a number of regional workshops. We could maybe devote a little time during these workshops to discuss uh, the monitoring issues to keep on, on top of it. Having, this is a good starting point, but to have it as a regular agenda item um, on the platform. Doesn't thank you. I would like I would like to thank all of my uh, panelists uh, of this morning uh, for their participation in this discussion. I think we have gathered a lot of information, and that's exactly the name of the of the EU platform is 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 to bring information together and to discuss the, the information available. Uh, one of the tasks also of the platform is to build up the website as an information portal, uh, as well for administrations involved in large carnivore management, as those involved in monitoring, uh, as the different stakeholders groups with an interest in, uh, in large carnivores. I have to say, we already have quite a number of good practice examples of monitoring schemes on the website, but also based on the discussion we had today, we will certainly build further on that and add further information on the websites. We had a poll at the beginning of the, of the meeting, and I would like to repeat the poll uh, we had at that moment. So for those who are not on menti.com, I would ask you, would like to ask you to go back to menti.com. And in the meantime, we are seeing uh, a slide again where you see the website and you see again the code 508943. And then this question is specifically for hunters. Would you like to contribute data to monitoring schemes for large carnivores? And I will give you a little bit time to answer. So this is a question specifically for hunters. So if you indicate it's you're a hunter, 
this is the time to answer this question. And I remember that when starting the meeting, we had almost a 100% yes. That's a little bit lower now uh, with, with people indicating uh, not longer to contribute data to monitoring schemes being percentual a little bit bigger. But I have to say we are not reaching the same number uh, of participants. So that's already an indication. Um, and then for the non-hunters, we have a similar question. Uh, do you think hunters data should be in monitoring schemes? So there too, I will give you a little bit of time to make your vote. And I see an increasing number of participants, non-hunters. And let's say I see still a 100% yes with a little bit above 30 participants. I don't see no anymore. Uh, we had uh, a few of them, a few percentages of them in the beginning. So I have the impression that during this webinar, uh, we have convinced the non-hunters that hunters data should be in the monitoring schemes, but we still don't have all of the hunters convinced to do so. So I would say that's clearly a task for <laughs> FACE and CIC to convince their people really to give their data. And we see that, let's say from the non hunter side, there is certainly a willingness to accept and use those data. That's for the, the menti.com uh, uh, and the Mentimeter uh, we had. Um, I would like now to come back to, to the webinar and I do the summing up. And what I would say is, First of all, we see that there are a lot of monitoring schemes. Uh, they are different, sometimes from country to country, sometimes from region to region. But I have also learned, and uh, John made a very clear statement of that, it's not about a single monitoring scheme. We need a combination of many of the monitoring schemes to get a full picture on how our large carnivore populations are doing in Europe. And with a lot of monitoring schemes, yes, we do need a lot of assistance to make sure that we are gathering as much data as possible. And that's another outcome is that I have seen that, that all of the stakeholders are very positive about the involvement uh, of hunters and not only of hunters, but of all stakeholders groups involved, uh, ranging from nature conservation organizations to hunters, uh, to tourism, uh, to foresters, um, so all of the, all those people who are, let's say, regularly in the territory of large carnivores, they can play a role in the monitoring. Uh, what was also very clear was that it's very important to have uh, transparency about the data so that people who are adding to the data load on large carnivores are also seeing that the data is used, how the data is used, and um, and get some feedback on that. Transparency is also very important for the larger public uh, so that they get a, have a feeling on what is happening with large carnivores in their region, um, how large carnivores are spread around uh, the European uh, Union, that too is, is, is very important. And then we have learned that, uh, let's say, uh, that monitoring technologies, of course, are evolving that more and more technology and scientific new approaches are playing a role. We have heard from John that camera trapping and, uh, and all but which is related to DNA uh, monitoring is becoming more and more important. Uh, there too, again, there is a role to, to play, uh, where stakeholders can play a, a role. And uh, we have seen that uh, certainly hunters can play an important role of this. We have uh, taped uh, the video, uh, we have taped the webinar, so it will be available on, on video afterwards on the EU platforms website. We will also look at a list of questions. I have to say most of them have been answered either during uh, 
the discussion we had, our, our panelists have written uh, have written answers uh, to some of you. There are still some open questions. We will take care that also those specific questions uh, will get answered. And then I'm coming uh, to the end of this meeting and I have to close uh, this webinar. I would like to thank well, certainly our speakers and our panelists, but I also would like to, to thank Ornella and Christian from Adelphi. Again, they did a terrific job organizing this webinar. And I have to say, um, I'm always a very happy uh, moderator uh, because the information I'm getting from them and the preparation done uh, on those uh, EU large carnivore platform webinars is so good as of a very high quality. And that makes uh, that it was a very easy task for me doing the moderation of today. And uh, we can have speakers, we can have panelists, we can have organizers, but if we do not have an audience, we would not have a webinar. So I would also like to thank all of our participants. Uh, and I have to say that they are still there. So that makes that uh, they done a, certainly did an, did an effort and probably it's an indication that there was an interest up to the end of this webinar. So thank you to all. Um, and I hope to meet you again digital or physical, but in the future, again, to further discuss problems related to coexistence and large carnivores. Thank you very much. Have a good lunch. And for those who are still monitoring this afternoon, do a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.